Okay, Your Worship, we're live. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Clerk. Good morning, uh, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good, good to see you full house today, I think. Uh, welcome, and uh, we'll uh, call this meeting to order, and I will look to Councillor DeLeo for our land acknowledgement. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, everyone. We begin our meeting by recognizing the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples of Canada as traditional stewards and caretakers of the land. We acknowledge that the town of Wasaga Beach is located within the boundaries of Treaty 18, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Tionantari, Wendat, and is the home of many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples as part of an intricate nationhood that reaches across Turtle Island. At this time of truth and reconciliation, we welcome the opportunity to work together towards new understandings and new relationships and ask for guidance in all we do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Megwish. Moving on to uh, 1.2, uh, 1 staff announcements, and I'll look to uh, uh, our deputy, or sorry, our clerk uh, for this, and to Rachel uh, from Bylaw. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I'm pleased to announce we have a new staff member. Please join me in welcoming our newest staff member to the team. Uh, Annie comes with a wealth of experience, having worked at the Town of Collingwood for the past 11 years. Most recently, she has served as a Legislative Services Coordinator in the Clerk's Department, showcasing her dedication to professionalism and attention to detail. Annie also holds a Bachelor of Arts from Laurentian University and has furthered her education in human resource management and occupational health and safety from Georgian College. Additionally, she has also obtained several certificates with AMCTO. And I know how hard that cor those courses can be, so that's awesome to hear. Um, Annie, uh, with Annie's expressive background and diverse sets, set of skills, we are confident that she will be a valuable asset to our team. So please join us in extending a warm welcome to Annie as she begins her new role as a business licensing officer with bylaw. Um, Annie, if you want to come up and just say a couple words, <laughs> putting her on the spot right away. Good morning, Annie, and welcome. Uh, good morning, Your Worship and Council. Um, just wanted to say I'm very excited um, to be in the town of Wasaga Beach. Um, it's been a busy two weeks, um, but I've learned a lot from Rachel. Um, the entire bylaw team has been extremely welcoming. They're a very friendly um, group, and I'm just very happy and excited to be part of the team. Um, happy to be here in Wasaga Beach and meet all of you wonderful people, and happy to maybe go on some walks on the beach um, over my lunch hours. <laughs> well, that's great, Annie, and uh, thank you, uh, and welcome to the team. We're, we're thrilled that you're here, and you bring a, a vast uh, knowledge and experience with you, so uh, we're quite confident you're going to fit in just well with uh, what we already have, which is an excellent team here in the town of Wasaga Beach, so welcome. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll invite Danielle Dent up to the podium. <laughs> uh, Danielle is joining the Clerk's Division as the Legislative Coordinator, and that was actually effective in February. Danielle has been extremely busy assisting with the transition in bylaw, um, and we are thrilled with what she's been able to achieve both in the Clerk's Division and bylaw division through the last couple months. Um, Danielle's been with the town for three years as the bylaw administrative assistant and licensing officer. Prior to that, Danielle held a number of positions with the County of Simcoe, major financial institutions, and law firms. Um, Danielle is also completing her municipal administration program with AMCTO, and we are thrilled to have her join uh, the Deputy Clerk and I in the Clerk's Division. Danielle? Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Your Worship. Um, yes, I'm very excited to start this new position um, and working alongside Nicole and Barb. So um, I'm going to gain a lot of experience and more knowledge that will just expand um, you know, my career here with the town. So thank you very much. And thank you, Danielle, for all your hard work and dedication to the town of Wasaga Beach for the last three years. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, absolutely uh, wonderful to work with you, uh, also and staff and council. Uh, you've been very helpful, uh, I know, to myself and many members of this council in many ways. So great to see you're moving up uh, in the in the chain, if you will, and uh, thrilled to have you uh, in the clerk's department. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I move on to item number two: proclamations. Uh, 
we do have a motion here that the Council Proclamation 2020, sorry, May 2024 as Community Living Ontario Month in the town of Wasaga Beach. Could I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Councillor Timms and Deputy Mayor Snell, all in favour? That motion carries unanimously. And I'll just note uh, that we do have an absence uh, here today with Councillor White, who is in Aruba with his lovely wife uh, enjoying a vacation, so uh, he does send his regrets. Um, and I also want to note, uh, I should have done this a little earlier, but the town of Wasaga Beach curling team brought home the gold this season in the Collingwood Corporate Curling League. Mike Pinsevero, Alan McClear, Dave Heatherly, Gerald Rue, and Amy Magia it was our team members. Uh, and uh, as I say, they brought home the, the gold. So we're proud of them and uh, they, they, they take up the big fight every year. And uh, they got a guy like Gerald on the team. <laughs> I don't know how big that fight is, but at any rate, they do a great job, and uh, you got uh, Mike there holding the trophy. So congratulations to uh, Team Wasaga, and we're very proud of you. <laughs> Moving on to item number three, disclosure of procuring interests. I have none before me at this time. If at some point throughout the meeting you feel you have a procuring interest, please let us know at that time. Item number four on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda, and I'll look to uh, our uh, clerk uh, for an amendment to that agenda. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, staff are removing report 17.1.1, beachfront property matter from the closed session um, meeting today. Um, there's been new information that came to light that requires us to look at that again. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So having heard that, we do have a recommendation uh, that the contents of the agenda for April 11th, 2024, be approved as amended. Could I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Uh, Councillor DeLeo and Councillor Eagle, all in favor? That motion carries unanimously. Item number five is the approval of the minutes, and this is the council meeting minutes and special council meeting of March 28, 24. Motion that the minutes of the council meeting held March 28, 2024, and the special council meeting held March 28, 2024, are hereby adopted as circulated. Questions or comments? Seeing none, the mover and a seconder, please. Councillor DeLeo and Councillor Eagle, all in favor? That motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item number six on the agenda, statutory public meetings. We do have two today. Uh, 6.1 is a public meeting under the Planning Act Zoning Bylaw Amendment Applications Z00324. This is blocks 26 and 29, Plan 51M923, River Road East and Stonebridge Boulevard. 6.1.1, the Planning Staff Presentation Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application. Uh, for Z00342 and uh, 6.1.2 Julia Redfern, Project Manager, Haymont Investments, River Road East and Stonebridge Boulevard Townhouse Proposal. This is a public meeting regarding the proposed site-specific amendments to the town zoning bylaw submitted for the property legally described as Plan 51M923, Block 26 and 29, municipally addressed as 265 and 271 River Road East no municipal address assigned to Block 29. The application being considered is the proposed zoning bylaw amendment town file number Z003-24. This public meeting is an opportunity for members of the public to learn more about the proposed development. For Council, this public meeting is to engage in debate regarding the merits of the application, nor is it intended to be a question and answer session. It is simply to make council aware of the public comments and ask any clarifying questions. Again, I want to reiterate today that no decisions are being made at this public meeting. Please be advised that you must make a request in writing if you wish to receive notice of any decision of council regarding these applications. To make a written request for notice of this meeting, please fill in the planning public meeting sign-in sheet located at the podium. Base uh, beside the deputy clerk who is seated at the side of our council chambers over here. Uh, town planning staff will now make a brief presentation and will provide further details with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. And I believe we have our planner Samantha with us. Samantha, good morning, and the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, there we go. So. Today I'm going to be presenting the planning staff uh, presentation for the public 
Thank you. For the public meeting for zoning bylaw amendment file number Z00324. So just a quick overview. Um, so first I'm going to be discussing the purpose of the public meeting. Um, next, I will outline the planning application process. Following that, I will be introducing the applicant's um, uh, application. And finally, I will be presenting the subject lands as well as the proposed development. So the purpose of the public meeting. A public meeting is required under the Planning Act for a Zoning Bylaw Amendment. Town staff are introducing the applicant's proposal to council and to the general public. The purpose of the public meeting is to provide an opportunity to the public for, for those sharing written comments and for making oral submissions to council. So the planning application process. So at this point in the process, we have received an application and have deemed it complete, as well as provided um, circulation of a notice of complete application and public meeting. Currently, we're at the public meeting, and following the public meeting, staff and agency review of the submission will occur. Um, then planning staff will prepare a staff recommendation report for council. Council will make a decision, and following that, there will be an appeal period. Proposal overview. So an application has been submitted for zoning bylaw amendment by Haymount Investments for the property seen here on the screen outlined in red. What's being proposed is 35 townhouse dwelling units, as well as a uh, vehicular access from a common element condominium road with um, access off of Stonebridge Boulevard and River Road East. So the site location. The site has an area of approximately 9,941 square meters with approximately 66 meters um, of frontage along Stonebridge Boulevard and approximately 140 meters of frontage along River Road East. Um, surrounding uses include residential uses as well as the Nottawasauga River to the north, uh, residential uses and the Stonebridge Trail Loop to the south. Um, to the east is residential uses as well as um, modular homes and the Stonebridge Trail Loop. And to the west is um, residential uses as well and vacant land and um, a stormwater management pond. So the existing official plan designation for these lands is neighborhood. Um, permitted uses um, within the neighborhood designation include medium density residential uses, including townhouses, um, among other uses. Um, additional um, uh, uses within the area or designations within the area include uh, neighborhood and open space. The existing zoning on the property is residential type three, um, exception 13, and there's a hold on the property. Within this zone, semi-detached street townhouses and townhouses are permitted uses. Um, surrounding lands include residential uses, environmental protection lands, uh, residential modular homes, and open space lands. So the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to modify the residential type three exception 13 zone provisions, um, specifically um, to reduce the minimum lot area, lot frontage and landscaped open space requirements, as well as to increase the maximum lot coverage and remove the requirement for a play area and to remove the requirement for the holding on the property. Um, additional um, provisions also include uh, encroachments for porches and verandas, balconies and stairs, uh, areas for porches, verandas and balconies, driveway setbacks and widths, and to recognize the proposed private street as a public street for the purpose of zoning bylaw setbacks. In, in, sorry. As well as the uh, zoning bylaw amendment application, the applicants have also submitted a site plan application um, as seen here on the screen. So the public meeting is required by the Planning Act. Town staff have presented the applicant's proposal and a de in detailed review of this application is ongoing but has not yet been completed. Staff is, will, be will be providing all of the received comments to council following the public meeting and a recommendation report will be provided to council at a later date. Thank you, um, everyone, and if you have any questions, we do have the planning um, email available there, and all materials can be, fi be found at the link on the screen. 
Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, now the applicant and or their agent will make a brief presentation and will provide further details with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. So we'd ask uh, representatives for Haymont to come forward, please. Good morning. So good morning, my name is Julia Redfern and I'm a registered professional planner. Today I'm here to provide you with an overview of the townhouse development proposal by Hama in the Stonebridge by the Bay community. The proposal pertains to lands legally referred to as blocks 26 and 29. The subject lands are currently vacant with an area of approximately 0.99 hectares and a frontage of 109 meters along River Road East and 67 meters along Stonebridge Boulevard. The site is located within the urban area where there is access to municipal sanitary, storm, and water services. There is an existing bus route located along the subject lands in addition to a municipal sidewalk and a painted bike lane on Stonebridge Boulevard. On the opposite side of River Road East to the north of the subject lands, there's a private community center, single detached dwellings up back onto the Nottawasega River. To the east and south, there's a public trail and residential dwellings, and to the west are future development lands and single detached dwellings. In the context of history and the broader surrounding area, the subject lands are part of a plan of subdivision that was registered in 2008. The subdivision includes a mix of uses and features that contribute to a complete neighborhood, including public walking trails, open green spaces, tree line boulevards, transit stops, medium and high density residential uses, bike lanes, restaurants, major retailers, and personal services. Hamilton has been actively developing the Stonebridge by the Bay community for over 15 years, playing a pivotal role in shaping the evolution of the neighborhood and enhancing the area's livability and attractiveness for residents and visitors alike. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. If I could just ask that you just step a little bit back from the mic. Oh, sure. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Online viewers are having a hard time. Oh, uh, no problem. <laughs> So planning and development on blocks 26 and 29 are guided by a comprehensive framework of provincial and local planning policies. The provincial policy statement serves as a foundational document with the overarching goal of promoting sustainable and prosperous communities while protecting the environment and public health and safety. The growth plan provides strategic vision for land use direction within the Greater Golden Horseshoe until 2051. It prioritizes the achievement of complete communities, fostering economic prosperity, environmental sustainability, and social equity. The County of Simcoe official plan prioritizes sustainable development that balances economic growth with preservation and natural and cultural heritage, while also promoting community well-being, accessibility, and public health and safety. The Town of Wasega Beach official plan outlines the town's land use framework and serves as a detailed document for evaluating development proposals, providing essential context and criteria for decision making. Blocks 26 and 29 are strategically located within the downtown Wasega Community Improvement Project area, particularly situated along the River Road East corridor. This corridor is envisioned to comprise a mix of residential and tourism oriented uses, gradually transitioning toward predominantly residential uses over time. Stonebridge Boulevard, designated as a collector road, serves primarily to facilitate traffic movements within and between community areas. In contrast, River Road East, designated as an arterial road, is intended to support traffic flows between major land use activity areas within the town. As shown on Schedule A10, Blocks 26 and 29 are designated neighborhood. This designation offers flexibility, allowing for a diverse array of complementary uses from low and medium residential, low and medium residential to commercial to community oriented facilities. Medium density residential uses must align with certain criteria, ensuring compatibility with adjacent uses, direct access to arterial or core collector roads and adequate servicing. The Town of Wasega Beach Zoning Bylaw serves as a regulatory instrument that implements the objectives and policies of the official plan, stating how land may be used, where buildings and other structures can be located, and requirements for lot sizes and dimensions, parking, building heights, and setbacks. Blocks 26 and 29 are zoned residential type 3 modified holding. Currently, semi-detached dwellings and townhouses are permitted on the subject lands. 
Additionally, a series of site-specific regulations govern aspects such as lot size, front yard depth, unit width, exterior and interior side yard, rear yard depth, and encroachments into the rear yard. The current site-specific zoning was established in 2006 when zoning modifications were being sought for the subdivision and prior to a detailed plan being created for the site. The proposal before you today includes six townhouse dwellings comprising a total of 35 freehold units. Each unit is allocated a minimum of two parking spaces with an additional nine visitor parking spaces provided. The townhouse dwellings are planned to be two stories in height with floor areas ranging in size from approximately 1,360 square feet to 1,950 square feet. To facilitate site access, a pre private rear laneway is proposed to connect to both River Road East and Stonebridge Boulevard and serves to provide vehicular entry to each lot. A new sidewalk is proposed along River Road East in addition to an internal sidewalk that connects to both Stonebridge Boulevard and River Road East. Additionally, a mix of deciduous and coniferous trees and shrubs are proposed along the streets and throughout the site. Here you will see the front, side, and rear elevations of Building 1, consisting of five units situated along River Road East with its side yard facing Stonebridge Boulevard. The building is oriented towards the public streets, facilitating access to entrances from the municipal sidewalks. Architecturally, the facades showcase a variety of design elements, including expansive windows, balconies, porches, and diverse roof lines. To create visual interest, the massing is articulated through a combination of materials, such as stone veneer and board and batten siding, complementing the existing aesthetic of the Stonebridge by the Bay community. Parking spaces are positioned at the rear of the units, contributing to a sense of street enclosure while limiting vehicular access to the public streets. Here you will see the front and side elevation of Building 6, consisting of seven units situated along the private laneway with its side yard facing Stonebridge Boulevard. Once again, you will notice a diverse range of design elements and building materials. The inclusion of a larger corner porch contributes to enhanced curb appeal, expands outdoor living space, and fosters social interaction. Additionally, the bell cast roof at the corner of the building harmonizes with the existing architectural style present throughout the community, contributing to a cohesive aesthetic. Overall, the design approach aligns with the direction outlined in the town, downtown with Sega Beach Urban Design Guidelines and the town's urban design guidelines for townhouse built form. Several essential documents were prepared in support of the development proposal. A topographical survey uh, detailed site features and elevations, a functional servicing and stormwater management report ensured adequate services, civil engineering drawings detailed erosion control, servicing, drainage, and grading plans, the traffic impact brief confirmed acceptable traffic conditions and site access locations, an arbitrary report and tree inventory and preservation plan identified trees for removal, an environmental impact study confirmed acceptable environmental impacts. A flood hazard study confirmed the development is outside of the floodplain. A geotechnical investigation recommended appropriate construction methods. Hydrogeological assessment evaluated potential impacts to groundwater resources. Planning justification report analyzed the proposal in context with planning documents. An operations and maintenance manual outlined schedule and maintenance procedures. A vibration monitoring program assessed ground-borne vibration impacts, and lighting and landscape plans offered further site details. These reports and plans collectively confirm the technical feasibility and appropriateness of the development proposal. A zoning bylaw amendment application is required to facilitate the development proposal. It essentially proposes to add or replace existing site-specific provisions, as shown here. The proposed lot area is four square meters smaller than currently permitted, with a reduced lot frontage to align with the permitted unit width. Additionally, site-specific landscaped open space and lot coverage provisions need to be added to facilitate a more efficient development. Considerations for front and side yard encroachments, driveways, and a play area are also included. The proposed provisions are consistent with existing developments in the Stonebridge by the Bay community. So to summarize the main takeaway, townhouses are permitted on the subject lands in both the town's official plan and zoning bylaw. The proposed development is consistent with or conforms to applicable provincial and local planning policy. The proposal is feasible from a technical perspective. The proposal aligns with the town of Wasaga Beach's urban design guidelines for um, the downtown and townhouse built form. And the proposal represents good land use planning. 
And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions and listen to any comments you may have. Thank you very much, Julia. All right, we will now uh, ask uh, the public if they wish to speak uh, to provide comments in favor or in opposition to the proposed developments. Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have any members of the public registered in advance to make oral submissions at today's virtual meeting uh, for today online? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. It looks like we've lost uh, the one participant, but we do have Angelo Garcia Gar on the line. Uh, Angelo, if you can turn your mic and your camera on, please. <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Clerk. Good morning, Angelo. Good morning. Thank you. And it's Garachi. So, Garachi. All right. All right. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? If you'd like to go ahead and uh, provide your comments or speak to the matter. Yeah, sorry, I, I, it blanked out there for a second. I, I just have a couple of clarific clarification questions, if I may. Yes, go ahead. So um, when it comes to, and these are basic questions. I mean, any residential housing in the area, we've been long time uh, seasonal residents, and so we're, we're supportive of that, but it's mostly just for clarification. Um, when it comes to the storm drainage management and uh, with the Caltex system that's being installed along the western boundary underneath the parking, proposed parking spaces as adjacent to the trail that's there, just some concerns uh, with that storm system because of the proximity of the natural drainage creek that's there and the soft silty soil. Is there any concerns about leaching into that natural creek that's there from the Caltex system that's being installed? Um, the Caltech system was proposed by the civil engineer. Um, it essentially holds the stormwater and then slowly infiltrates it into the ground um, and it provides a low impact development measure. Um, I don't suspect they would propose a um, system that would adversely impact the soils, um, but I can provide a detailed comment from the response from the civil engineer. Yeah, it's just a curiosity on the proximity of how close it is to there's the separator of the trail and then the depth of that creek, uh, just based on elevation, would put it probably just below where the Caltex system would be going in place. And because it's soft, sandy soil, it's just a concern. And that kind of goes hand in hand with in walking that path and being in that area for quite some time. There, there is a natural creek that was shown going across the uh, boundary on what would be the south side, which doesn't appear to have water anymore and seems to be partially filled in. And uh, there was a culvert pipe that extended under the path, and ultimately it used to extend under the old Morris campsite there. And I was just wondering uh, if that was in fact actually a natural creek or if it was just a drainage creek and, and what the standing is on that. Uh, yes, that's an existing drainage route. It's gonna continue to facilitate flows to that um, pipe. But it is, when we inspected it, it was primarily dry um, throughout all three yeah. seasons. But it's so, in effect, it'll kind of be maintained through the backyards of the properties that are proposed there? That is correct. In a culvert system or an open system? Yes, it's gonna to go to the existing culvert. It was more okay. recently installed. Okay, um, just a couple of other quick questions, and thank you so much for answering. Um, the units that are proposed, it talks about 35 units, and I know that um, there are certain proposed usages and just speaking to density are they looking to allow triplexes to be installed uh, can these 35 units be in fact multi-unit dwellings Airbnbs rentals things like that or are there any restrictions in place for that and it's just strictly speaking to density um, only townhouses are proposed only town so none of the proposals include multifamily dwellings or triplexes no that's correct okay um, and the last question is, so you had talked about the, the street area being a private, a private lane. So I guess the understanding is the city's municipal services will be uh, routed through that. So storm sanitary for city purposes will be routed through that area? Um, yes, so there's gonna be a, a, a proposed sanitary system connected to Stonebridge Boulevard and then a looped municipal um, water system connected to both Stonebridge and uh, River Road East. 
And are those municipal services being carried by the township or is this something that's a private source system that's being carried by the developer? In other words, is the township carrying the freight for the infrastructure? Um, no, that will be uh, the developer. And it's going to be a common element condominium for the road. Right, and it's tied in. Okay. Um, and then um, just the creek. I think that's pretty much it. So, yeah, my major concern, I, I mean, major concern is a strong word. My concern is just with the cult, uh, the Caltex system and its proximity to the creek and just any leaching in that creek. Um, my understanding, and, I, and I, I know I've spoken to one of uh, one of the neighbors, and there's been some redesign of the pipe work, but historically that pipe uh, would travel under the hotel or adjacent to the hotel and directly into the river. Now, again, I, I, that may have changed, but that that's where the concern is. That's all. Okay. Yes, I can have our um, civil engineer provide a detailed comment and reach out to you with that. Great. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much, Angelo. Uh, great questions and. Uh, I'm sure they will get back to you with the answers required. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have anyone further online? Uh, through your worship, we do not have anyone else online at this moment. Uh, we do have some speakers in the audience, if you'd like me to proceed with their names. Uh, yes, and if that uh, second person online comes back, just let us know when we'll make sure we uh, receive their questions or comments. So yeah, we could move to the audience. Uh, Sounds good. That would be great. Thank you. So uh, we have Suzanne, Jess, Jesse, and Carl Pasco, and Suzanne will be speaking on behalf of the group, if you'd like to come up. Suzanne, good morning. Good morning. Recognize that name? Oh, I see Dad's here. Yes. All right. Carl, good to see you. Go ahead. Um, I guess my biggest concerns at this point are going to be noise. The noise that's coming in right now just from clearing the land is been terrible. Um, we're getting all, everything from just the noise coming in. We're getting excess amounts of dust and dirt being thrown up into the air. Um, the next biggest concern is we have lost all the privacy along that road. All the privacy along that road. So now everyone that's driving up River Road can see right into our, into our house, our whole house. That's not the next problem. Once we start getting these townhouses in there, everyone's gonna be able to see right into our land. Um, that's a huge concern. We've never had this as one of our big concerns. Privacy is, is huge when you own a home. Um, and I, feel, I, I fear that we're not gonna have that anymore. We have no greenery left when we look outside. It's, it's awful, it's been terrible. So do you have a request? Um, um, I think a, a fence to be put in would be ideal and any sort of shrubbery to help just put the greenery back in would be wonderful. Um, not to build there would be even better, but I don't think that's gonna be the case, to put all the trees back. Um, but I think a fence would be ideal, a tall one to keep our privacy. All right, I'm sure those comments will be taken in place. Did you uh, have anything further in it? If not, I'll get, uh, I'll get uh, the developer's team to respond to you here. Perfect, if there is anything else, can I go straight to Steve for that? You may, yes. Thank you. All right. All right, did you have a response, uh, Julia? Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of privacy, a uh, fence is proposed along the south and east boundary of the site, um, which is along the trail. And then in terms of dust, um, that will be addressed in the erosion and sediment control plans, and um, noise will have to comply with the noise bylaw. All right, so to be clear, there is a fence going to be along that boundary that would be between the Haymont property and uh, Pascal's property. Uh, is that to the south? To the south. Yes. Uh, south would be, get my bearings here. Sorry. <laughs> so the, can you, can you pull that up? Can we pull that up on the screen again? And so we can just show to be clear. Okay. Um, Um, yes, so. Uh, either, one is, uh, either one is fine, I think. Um, so in that image, along the, both the trail on the northeast um, side of the plan, along the trail, 
I'm going to try to show it the mouse. Um, yes, right there. So there's a, along that entire property boundary, there's a fence proposed. Okay. And same with along um, the <laughs> rear yard of building six, five, and four. All right. Yes. Thank you, Julia. Madam Deputy Clerk. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. We have no other speakers. Um, let me just double check. Uh, no, we do not have any other speakers on this item. All right, thank you, Madam Deputy Clerk. I'll ask one more time if there's anyone in the audience today who wishes to come forward to give comment, uh, whether it be uh, in favor or an objection of this uh, proposed development, please come forward at this time. State your name and address for the record. All right, seeing nobody, uh, we'll now look to members of council if they have any clarifying questions with regards to the proposed development. Members of council? Uh, Councillor Timms? Thank you, Your Worship. I was just uh, wondering for clarification why the play area was removed. Is it uh, uh, a cost efficiency matter? Um, and, uh, uh, or is it assumed that there won't be children in, in these townhouses? All right, thank you, uh, Councillor Timms. Julia? Mm -hmm. Um, the requirement is typically for like a block plan where um, there is eight units per lot is what the provision says and then you have to provide a 5% play area. Um, this typically hasn't been provided and most of the developments are um, acknowledged as required and the removal um, facilitates a more efficient development um, with additional units and there are, it is unexpected who the residents of the future um, development is going to be and if that would be useful, but there are other um, areas, amenity spaces within the community that can be used. That is why it's removed. All right, so I think, I think there is a park in the community already. Roughly how far away is that? Mm. Okay, so I... Uh, Walking distance, two and a half blocks. Two and a half blocks <laughs> on Wally. All right, thank you very much. All right, um, any other comments, uh, Councillor Belanger? Yeah, thank you, through the mayor. Uh, <clears throat> a couple uh, points of uh, clarification there, there uh, and I ask this every time, but there were some requests uh, to uh, adjust setbacks and lot coverage. And uh, I, looking at the drawings, I suspect that none of those are president setting, these are, we're, we're still dealing with uh, an official plan that is uh, quite outdated and a new one's coming shortly. And I believe all of the requests are pretty standard requests of the developments we've been doing for a number of years. So uh, uh, maybe you can just confirm that that's the case for the audience. Uh, yes, that is accurate. The proposed provision aligned with what has been approved throughout the community. Thank you. and. Uh, I, I was contacted by uh, a resident uh, that also brought up uh, and uh, wasn't able to be here today and wanted to know about fencing and uh, the, uh, the resident that uh, spoke was concerned about privacy. Now the fencing I believe on the, that is in place now on the south side uh, behind the existing development is a chain link fence. Uh, so uh, uh, limited uh, uh, privacy other than people can't walk onto your property. So is the plan is to have a, a matching chain link fence on, on the perimeter of the, uh, what would be the south side and the uh, east side of the development? Um, yes, I believe it's a chain link fence currently proposed. Okay, thank you. And the, the final thing is the the, the resident that spoke about density, I, I know the planning is uh, not to do uh, any uh, Airbnb or, or triplex or anything like that, uh, but my understanding is that provincially uh, that a resident could divide one of these residents legally and create an auxiliary apartment. Is, uh, is that correct? 
Um, yeah, I believe it was Bill 23. You're permitted to have up to three units per lot as long as it conforms to the zoning bylaw requirements. Yeah, I, ju I just uh, thought that clarification mm -hmm. for the public. Uh, uh, generally, in this type of development, that's very limited, but because it is uh, provincial legislation, I, I thought we would uh, give clarity to that resident. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Trevor, can you just touch on that a little bit further uh, for uh, the public's information? Yes, Your Worship. Um, Julie, can you just, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Boulanger is correct. Uh, Bill 23, which was enacted uh, basically about a year and a change a little bit ago, does allow by right uh, up to three units, including in townhouses. Uh, however, uh, that comes with certain stipulations. So there are some provisions that have been waived by the government, such as minimum uh, lot, or sorry, minimum accessory dwelling unit sizes by GFA. And you have to provide parking at a scale of one space for every accessory apartment and two for the main use. So although those permissions are allowed under section 35.1 of the Planning Act, there are still some regulations that are required in the zoning bylaw. And um, while it's not impossible, I think if we were to look at the site plan and based on the site provisions and the parking that's being provided, it is unlikely that you'll see those kind of accessory dwelling units, but it is allowed by right. And that's for singles, semis, townhouses that are on full urban services across Ontario. Thank you, Trevor. So, so to be clear, uh, the provincial government has legislated uh, these rules and regulations uh, that the municipality is bound to adhere to. Um, but I think the restriction here would be parking. Uh, and I just want to clarify then visitor parking is not able to be used as parking for uh, one of those incinerary uh, units. Is that correct? Correct. So if there is in fact visitor parking required for a townhouse, and I'm not 100% sure that that's the case, <laughs> but if it was, that would be required parking. So it would be parking in addition to that. So in this case, we have nine visitor parking spaces. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure there's clarity for the public. If someone was deciding they wanted to put a rental unit in their basement, but they already used two of their, their two parking spaces, they couldn't allot a visitor parking space uh, for that other apartment. Correct. correct? So if the, if the zoning bylaw required that the minimum is uh, nine visitor parking spaces, then they would have to find parking elsewhere. If one of those nine visitor spaces was in excess of the minimum, then potentially they could, but then that would be up to the condominium corporation to grant that person that permissions. All right. Thank you very much. All right, any other questions, Councillor DeLeo? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. I have a quick question. You indicated that you've got a chain link fence and you're gonna continue with the chain link fence. Hypothetically, if the residences require more privacy, would you be willing to put in maybe a six foot wooden fence or PVC for better privacy? Thank you. Yes, we could consider that through the site plan process. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. You took my question away now, and uh, so that's good to know that you will consider that, and uh, I'm quite confident that that can be accomplished. So, any other questions or comments from members of Council? All right, seeing none, uh, thank you very much, Julia, and thank you, staff. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, I'm assuming we have nobody else online now? Uh, through Your Worship, that is correct. There's no other speakers registered. All right, and no one else here in the audience that wishes to come forward? So you know one, uh, thank you very much. And we'll therefore uh, ask that uh, um, staff now uh, bring back that report to us and seeing that there's no further comments or questions regarding this application, we'll now declare this public meeting hereby officially closed. And we'll now move on to uh, the next item, which is another public meeting, item 6.2. Uh, planning staff presentation to zoning bylaw application Z00224 and 6.2.2 .2 is Corey Quishman, Quishman, uh, Chisholm, sorry, uh, MHBC Planning, Urban Design and Landscaping Architecture, CVD Residential Development Proposal. This is a public meeting regarding the proposed site specific amendment to the town zoning bylaw submitted uh, for the property legally described as part of lot 36, concession four being a vacant lot fronting onto Beechwood Road and Fairgrounds Road. 
The application being considered is the proposed zoning bylaw amendment town file number Z002-24 and an application submitted by CBD Wasaga Beach Inc. This public meeting is an opportunity for members of the public to learn more about the proposed development and for council, this public meeting is not to engage in debate regarding the merits of the application, nor is it intended to be a question and answer session. It is simply to make council aware of the public's comments and to ask any clarifying questions. Again, I reiterate that no decisions will be made at this public meeting. Please be advised that you must make a request in writing if you wish to receive a notice of any decision of council regarding these applications. And to make a written request for notice of this meeting, please fill in the planning public meeting sign-in sheet located at the podium beside the deputy clerk who is seated at the side of council chambers over there. Town planning staff will now make a presentation and will provide further details with respect to the uh, proposed zoning bylaw amendment. And uh, we have Candace here with us today. Good morning, Candace. The floor is yours. Good morning, Your Worship, Council, and members of the public in attendance, in chambers, and virtually today. I am Candace Bondercheck, Senior Planner for the Town of Wasaga Beach, and I am assigned to this file and will introduce the proposed zoning bylaw amendment for lands currently without a municipal address. However, they are legally described as Part Lot 36, Concession 4, and this application has been submitted on behalf of CBD Wasaga Beach. The outline for this morning's public meeting will follow the town's standard format. Mayor Smith has introduced the public meeting and planning staff will now describe the purpose of a public meeting, the planning process, and present an overview of the applicant's proposed development. In accordance with the Planning Act, I can confirm that notice was circulated and this public meeting is required for a proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Planning staff introduced the applicant's proposal to council and the purpose of this public meeting is to provide the public, stakeholders, agencies and boards an opportunity to provide written comments and oral submissions to council. This slide indicates where we are in the planning process. So far planning staff have received the application, deemed the application complete, circulated public meeting notice, and now here we are today at the public meeting. The purpose of the public meeting today acts essentially as an information gathering session for staff and agencies to then review the comments received to date and at a later date provide council with a staff recommendation report. From there, Council will render a decision on the application and then staff issue a notice of decision and the appeal period commences. This slide indicates what the applicant has applied for and an overview of the proposal. So this is an application for a zoning bylaw amendment su submitted to facilitate a 459 dwelling unit residential development consisting of four five-story apartment buildings with a total of 160 dwelling units. One of those apartment buildings will contain commercial space on the ground floor. 299 proposed condominium townhomes as well as stacked townhouse dwelling units. And there's also um, a proposed communal amenity building, open space, park, I believe it's 1.7 acres and a stormwater management pond. The subject lands will also be subject to future applications for site plan control and plan a condominium. However, no public meeting is required for those applications in accordance with the Planning Act. Again, here's an aerial photo of the subject land with site statistics. So you'll see Fairgrounds Road to the west um, and Beach Wood to the northeast. Uh, the lot area is approximately 136,000 square meters, 13.6 hectares a frontage of approximately 178 meters along Fairgrounds Road. Uh, surrounding uses to the north are residential, um, to the south, vacant to the east, and of course we have the storage facility to the west and uh, our neighbors, the town of Collingwood boundary. The subject land is legally described again as lot, part of lot 36 concession for Fairgrounds Road and no municipal address is assigned. Here's the existing official plan designation. So our current official plan uh, de designation is neighborhood 
uh, high density residential and open space. Permitted uses include apartments in the high density residential block that you'll see fronting onto Beechwood. Uh, permitted uses in neighborhood include, but are not limited to, of course, the townhouses, uh, the stacked townhouses that are being proposed. The official plan designations surrounding the subject property include neighborhood, service commercial, and recreation commercial. <clears throat> Here's the existing zoning. The zoning of the property is recreational commercial. Permitted uses, of course, include banquet hall, clubs, drive-in theaters, golf courses, uh, recreational com commercial uses essentially. Surrounding land uses are residential type one, service commercial, and the development zone. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to rezone the recreational commercial zone and type 1R1 zone. There is a small piece that you can probably barely make out along Beechwood Road that is R1, so that's that small portion that is currently zoned R1. And uh, the applicant's looking to uh, amend that to a residential type 3 exception to facilitate the proposed townhomes, regular and stacked, and the communal communal amenity buildings and park. Also to a residential type four exception to facilitate the proposed apartment dwellings and commercial use and the open space exception zone to recognize the EP block to the northwest. Additionally, technical amendments are proposed to establish site specific development standards to address the proposed condo tenure. Here's our concluding remarks slide. Uh, this public meeting is required in accordance with the Planning Act. Town staff are presenting the applicant's proposal. A detailed review of the applications is ongoing. We're in the early stages of the planning process and it's not yet completed. Planning staff will forward received comments to council subsequent to this meeting. Staff will provide a recommendation report to council at a later date. Thank you very much, Your Worship and Council, and uh, if the members of the public need to contact us or uh, need additional information, there is the supporting materials link on this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Candice, and we'll now ask uh, the applicant and or their agent uh, to come forward to make a brief presentation and to provide further details with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Good morning. Welcome. The floor is yours. Good morning, members of council and members of the public and town staff. Uh, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you. My name is Corey Chisholm. I'm a registered professional planner and a partner with MHBC Planning in our Barry office. I'm here before you this morning uh, on behalf of our client, uh, Castle Valley Developments, or otherwise known as CVD, uh, to present the proposed zoning bylaw amendment to facilitate their proposed residential development uh, at Beechwood and uh, Fairgrounds Road. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, town staff uh, for their efforts uh, on this file to date. Uh, we have been uh, working towards uh, the zoning uh, bylaw application uh, for a bit of time now, um, and we're looking forward to uh, being here today to present the public meeting. So just for uh, members of the public's uh, reference, um, the pro I know this is the first time many of them are seeing the proposed development application. Uh, the process that we've had to follow uh, previous to this uh, was to come in and do what's known as a formal pre-consultation meeting uh, with town staff. Uh, so we have that meeting with town staff. Also, we receive comments from members of the County of Simcoe, as well as the Ottawa Saga Valley Conservation Authority. Uh, through that process, they outline uh, a comprehensive list of reports and studies that need to be completed and submitted to form what's known as a complete application. And we have to... Uh, meet that milestone before we can come forward for the public meeting. Uh, so as seen on this slide, there is uh, a large uh, project team involved in the proposed development, and there was a long list of uh, reports and studies that were required to be completed and submitted in support of the proposed application. And all of those reports and studies are uh, reviewed by corresponding uh, professionals uh, on the public side, so there is a, a uh, back and forth process as we will receive comments on those, we'll make any required updates uh, as we work uh, through the process. Some of those reports include a, a planning justification report, uh, which our office prepared, 
And there's other technical studies such as uh, environmental impact studies, uh, as well as engineering studies uh, to cover off uh, services, stormwater management, uh, and traffic, among others. Uh, so as Ms. Bondarchuk outlined, uh, here's the site location. Uh, the majority of the frontage is along uh, Beechwood Road, uh, with there being frontage on Fairgrounds Road to the west. Uh, and we are right at the border between Wasega Beach uh, and Collingwood along Fairgrounds Road. Seen here is the conceptual site plan. Uh, at this stage, we are uh, seeking the zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, if we are successful with the zoning bylaw amendment process, uh, a next step would be to come forward with the more detailed uh, site plan and work through the, the site plan approval process uh, as well as the corresponding draft plan of condominium process. Uh, the proposed development um, is a mix of different uh, residential uses and it is in a condominium format. So all of the internal roads uh, would be private condominium roads. Uh, the proposed development largely follows the site-specific policies that are approved and in place today in the town's official plan. Uh, which I'll go through in a bit more detail in the following slide, and, and Ms. Bondarchuk had also uh, outlined. So the location where the four uh, apartment buildings are proposed is in the high density designation uh, that's in effect today in the town's official plan. Uh, and the proposed buildings uh, would either be uh, in the future um, four stories uh, if they're uh, pure residential or five stories if there is parking uh, underneath the buildings. Uh, this time that is what's contemplated, but that would be confirmed uh, through the future site plan approval process. Uh, there is some mixed use contemplated uh, within uh, those buildings, specifically the one at the entrance. So there, there is envisioned permission for some small uh, convenience commercial type uses uh, to serve the local area and the ground floor of that building. Uh, then in the interior of the site, we have a variety of uh, townhouses and stacked townhouses uh, proposed. Uh, the exact split of those uh, would be determined at the site plan approval stage. However, we are uh, limited with the maximum density that's in place today in the town's uh, official plan. Uh, the site has also been provided uh, or designed to have generous uh, open space. So there is a, a long linear park uh, crossing the site connecting the stormwater management pond in the southeast. Uh, the stormwater management pond will also be designed with a, a landscape trail and access road around it. Uh, and then there's a large open space block in the northwest corner of the site. Uh, through the environmental impact study, that area was identified as a wetland uh, that must be protected. Uh, so the environmental impact study established the feature and the required uh, buffer, which set the development constraint area, and the proposed development works within that uh, development limit that was established. I'll also note uh, Beechwood Road is a unique road today. Um, while it seems like a, a typical local road, it is still under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, so we do need to follow MTO uh, requirements and they are uh, involved in the review process. Uh, one of those requirements is a 14 meter setback from the limits of the MTO right away, uh, which is quite a bit more significant than what would typically be required on any other uh, local road within town. This slide shows the uh, active transportation connectivity uh, that's been incorporated into the proposed uh, development. Um, so the development is envisioned as being very uh, uh, geared towards uh, active transportation uh, with looping um, pedestrian uh, connections, both within the internal condominium roads with sidewalks, as well as through the, the linear park. Uh, and those would tie into both the uh, environmental feature at the top, as well as the stormwater management pond at the southeast corner. This slide again just shows the kind of the linear connection with the, the different green spaces that are incorporated into the proposed development. Uh, also envisioned on either end of that linear park, we can see two small purple structures. Uh, those are envisioned as uh, condominium amenity buildings. So one would likely be a, a gym available to the, the tenants, um, and another one uh, might be more of a community room. Shown here are the uh, conceptual cross sections that have been prepared. Uh, so the development is, from an urban design perspective, um, the townhouses have been designed as, as what are known as uh, rear laneway style townhouses. So the bottom image 
Uh, on the right, you can see you would have the front doors fronting into a uh, landscaped uh, pedestrian area. Um, and then the garages and the driveways would be on the back side. So you'd have uh, kind of a, a pedestrian interface on the uh, front doors facing each other. And then on the backs, you'd have, uh, again, a, a landscaped area uh, with the smaller condominium roads coming in to access the, uh, the driveways uh, and garages. Shown here is the uh, official plan designation that's in effect today. Uh, again, in that the black and white hatch along Beechwood Road, that is the existing uh, high density uh, designation, uh, which does a pit permit apartments and it does permit apartments uh, up to five stories in height. Uh, the remaining white area is the residential area, which permits a variety of uh, ground oriented types of dwellings, uh, such as single detached, semi, and, and townhouses uh, as are proposed. Uh, so the, de the development has been proposed to conform with the town's official plan. Uh, and one of those governing factors is the uh, density that is permitted. So there is a different maximum density outlined in both the medium density, uh, which is the, the area in white, as well as the high density uh, along Beechwood Road, uh, and is proposed to uh, meet that maximum density in the high density of 74 units uh, per net residential hectare. Uh, and the medium density, uh, as of the current layout, we're just under that at 36 uh, units per net residential hectare. And here we see those density areas overlaying on top of the plan. So we can see the, the area in red uh, is where the apartments are located within, uh, and the balance of the site, uh, excluding the environmental area at the top, uh, is within that medium density area. Here's the, uh, the current zoning. Uh, it is uh, a bit unique. The current zoning is recreational commercial, or CR. Um, the previous landowner, uh, who our firm also uh, represented, uh, had moved forward with the site-specific official plan amendments uh, on the site. Uh, however, they never did proceed forward with uh, the development, so the historic zoning is still in place today. Um, the site was acquired by our client, Castle Valley Developments, uh, within the last year or two, uh, and to move forward with the development, they now have to amend the zoning to align with the town's official plan. Uh, the recreational commercial zoning is historic, going back to when Beechwood Road was old Highway 26, and the permitted uses today in that zone are things like amusement park, uh, club, um, uh, different things that used to be uh, seen, along, kind of that tourist commercial type use that was common along old Highway 26. Uh, so now with the new highway, those types of uses uh, aren't as viable in the area, and we're looking to convert the zoning to align with the town's official plan of a residential nature. Shown here is the proposed zoning schedule. So the proposed zoning will align with that, uh, the town's official plan. So we'll have environmental protection in the northwest corner, which ensures that that wetland feature uh, is maintained and protected in the long term. Uh, the hatching is, aligns with the high density designation and the balance with the dots is the, the medium density or lower density uh, residential. Uh, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, there are a number of site specific uh, provisions we need to implement. Um, one factor that's led to there being more than might be typical is the fact that the site is being designed as a condominium development, so the individual units won't be on their own lots. Uh, it will all be one large property under the uh, condominium development. So uh, the town zoning bylaw, the way it's structured, is more set up for a freehold uh, situation where each unit is on its own lot. Uh, so many of the zone standards have been recharacterized uh, to fit the, the format that's proposed through the condominium. So again, these are the proposed zone provisions for the site, uh, recharacterized uh, to suit the, the proposed uh, condominium format of the development. These are uh, provisions that are divided between the, the high density area uh, and the balance of the site. Um, so one nuance with the maximum height, again, up to five stories is permitted in the official plan uh, if you have parking, uh, structured parking under the building on the ground level. So the way the maximum height set up is, 
in the zoning as it does permit four stories uh, or five if we have that parking uh, underneath uh, the building. We are also uh, including uh, permissions for some uh, limited commercial in that uh, mixed use, so we c in that high density area, so we can have some uh, mixed use development. There is a, a reduction in the minimum parking proposed through the proposed zoning. So for the uh, traditional townhouse units, uh, it would be a two space uh, per unit, uh, including visitor parking. Uh, and then for the, t the stacked townhouses, as well as the apartments, uh, it would be one space per unit with a visitor requirement of 0 0.25 uh, visitor spaces per unit. Uh, and we are also asking for a uh, reduction to the typical retail uh, minimum parking requirement uh, in the town zoning bylaw. So as far as next steps, uh, we'll receive uh, comments from both the public and council today. Uh, we'll continue to review uh, those which will uh, uh, influence a future resubmission uh, with some, any updated materials that are required and, and we'll continue to work with town staff and other agency staff to address all comments. A uh, recommendation report will be brought forward to council at a, a future council meeting uh, for a decision. Uh, and assuming we are successful with the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, uh, as mentioned, we will need to move forward uh, with the detailed site plan approval process as well as draft plan condominium uh, in the future. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, council members of the public and happy to answer uh, any questions. I should mention as well, we do have representatives uh, from our clients uh, engineering consultant with us as well. So we have uh, members from Crozier Engineering that can also assist in, in answering any engineering related questions that might come up. Thanks. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have any members of the public registered in advance to make oral submissions at today's virtual public meeting? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. We have no virtual participants, but we do have uh, those in person that would like to speak. All right. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Clerk. So I would ask members of the public if you wish to speak uh, either in favor or opposed to uh, this project to please come forward uh, one at a time and state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, through Your Worship, if we can start with Judith Burt. We can absolutely start with Judith Burt. Good morning, Judith. Welcome. Hi, thank you. So how's my voice level and distance from the mic? It's like you're an old pro at this. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm Judith Burt. I live at Nine Canoe Road in Blue Water. Although I've been around Wasaga Beach for 20 years, first on the river, then in Allenwood, so I was interested in the previous um, River Road East business. And, uh, I happily moved to Blue Water for the peace and quiet and the sound of coyotes coming across our back street uh, uh, from the wetlands and so therefore you can tell I'm kind of worried about what's happening to that space. But I do have three questions if I'm allowed. Okay, um, first of all, what's a stacked townhouse compared to a regular townhouse? Just, uh, Trevor, do you want to answer that question? With your permission, Your Worship, perhaps if we could get all three questions and then I'll have Corey, perhaps uh, that would be easier for everyone. All right, great. Thank okay. you. All righty, thank you. Uh, well, I was going to ask where the parking was going to be in the development um, other than underneath various buildings, uh, if that didn't proceed. And I was also going to ask, I guess this would be the town, all those uh, units will have a lot of little kids that are going to be going to school. Are they going to be crossing um, in those large numbers without a stoplight? So that was a question that I had. And then, okay, so those are my questions. All right, did you have any other comments to make yes. before? Sure, go ahead. Yes, because um, it was echoing a previous comment about privacy um, featuring five-story buildings right on our back, in our backyards. Uh, a concern about changing the whole feeling of our, of our area. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Trevor? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, perhaps if, uh, if I may, I will ask Corey and the uh, traffic or, or their engineering staff. I'm not sure if we've gotten comments from the consortium on the school busing yet, but uh, perhaps Corey can help us out with the stack townhouse definition and the parking. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thank you for those comments. Uh, so I think I can work through uh, all four of them, so I'll just go in order. 
the first question, what is a stacked townhouse? Um, so uh, it's very similar to how it's, uh, it's defined. Um, there's, uh, the built form is, looks very much like a traditional townhouse with uh, ground-oriented units that are separated uh, horizontally. However, instead of there just being one unit that might be three stories high, there's actually two units. So there's a unit um, on the ground floor, and then there's a unit that's uh, on the second and third floor. Um, and you have to do those in a condominium tenure because there are shared walls um, and some uh, nuances with parking and, and access for that upper unit. Um, but they do have independent access uh, from the ground. Typically they come in, have a small landing entrance area, and then it's, it stairs up to their, their unit. Um, I actually used to, to live in one uh, in Barrie. Uh, the uh, question about parking. Um, so parking for the uh, apartment buildings. Um, there is a combination of uh, surface uh, under the buildings uh, and underground currently being contemplated. Uh, th that would be further worked out uh, through the site plan control process. And then similarly for the townhouses and the stacked townhouses, they each would have a, a garage. Um, some will have a parking within driveways and then there's some areas where the parking would be on the uh, private condominium uh, laneways. Uh, again, that would be uh, determined through the future site plan control process. Uh, and we would need to meet, uh, at a minimum, the proposed parking rates that are uh, currently proposed to be included within the site-specific zoning. Uh, thirdly, the, the question about school buses. Uh, we did receive comments, I think, just in the last day or two uh, from the school board. Um, they did identify that um, kids would need to be bused, and they, they were seeking clarification that school buses would be able to enter, uh, navigate uh, the internal roads, and. Um, they're asking if there could be potentially like a lay-by or something to help with pickup within the site. So we, we did just receive that. Um, at this point, I believe that comment can be accommodated, but I haven't had a chance to take that back with our architect and engineer team. So that's certainly something we'll be addressing through the future resubmission. Finally, the, the concern raised uh, about privacy. Certainly that's a concern where we see a difference in height. Um, I did point out the Currently, in the town's official plan, up to five stories is permitted um, in this area of the site, and the proposed zoning is looking to implement that. Um, that being said, uh, the width of Beechwood Road plus the MTO setback on either side is certainly uh, assisting in that separation distance. So there is uh, approximately 50 meters from the, where the proposed apartments can be located to the rear fence of the uh, residents across the street. So it would be, I, I, I'm not sure how deep their rear yards are, but it would be a bit further to their, their actual dwellings. Um, there is a, a bit of an existing berm uh, along that side of, of Beechwood Road, uh, which at this point uh, is proposed to be uh, maintained. And, and again, there'll be detailed grading and landscape plans that will be prepared and submitted through uh, the future site plan approval process. Uh, but we do envision uh, landscaping uh, in that area as well. All right, thank you very much, Corey. Madam Deputy Clerk, we have someone else. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Next one in line is Lydia Bax. You know, I said I was going to be speaking today. Oh, sorry about that, Lydia. Uh, Alan McLaughlin. Morning, Alan. Morning, Brian. Good to see you. Your Honor, good to see you again. Good to see you. I voted for you, what can I say? Um, so I'm uh, Alan McLaughlin. I'm uh, on the board of the condo across the street. Uh, on May 4th, I'll be uh, the president of the condo board. So I represent uh, 115 homes and, and probably 200 owners. Uh, I'm not speaking for them all. I'm speaking for myself. Um, but I was, in, um, I was in bed this morning thinking about, um, which I often do, um, lying there thinking about uh, something that's going to come up. I always I wake up 20 minutes before my alarm. Um, and I thought, what if I lived across the street in this community? And I thought to myself, I, could, I had two choices. I could live in one of the tall apartment buildings. Um, and uh, if I did, um, I would have a great view out over Georgian Bay. Um, I'd probably be a little bit concerned because the buildings are very close to the 14 meter setback uh, from the highway. And, and maybe I'd be a bit concerned that in the winter months when the, uh, when they, um, the, um, 
the, the sun is low. I, the, all the houses on, on, um, on Lee, Lee, uh, Leeward Avenue across the street would be in darkness um, in the afternoons. So that, that might bother me. However, I would be in one of these houses with 10 units per floor. Um, or I could be in one of the smaller um, buildings. Uh, each of those buildings I noted on the plan was, there are 24 of them, which means there would be 12 families in each building doing the math. Um, and uh, if, I, if I lived in one of those, of course, there'd be um, 900 garbage cans to be picked up by the garbage trucks. Um, and if I was a child, um, I would <coughs> probably um, want to go play in my neighborhood. Um, but there are 300 um, families in that small amount of space. So, and, and if I were in one of the interior buildings, there'd be no front yard or backyard. So, what would I do? I'd probably, um, I'd probably look to play somewhere. Um, and I'd notice that there are no playgrounds in the neighborhood. There's one strip of grass between the, the um, apartment towers and the, the 300 homes uh, that would be communal to everybody. But as I kick a football around, I really have to dodge the dog poo because of all the animals that would be in the neighborhood. So, um, and then if uh, I were an adult, I wanted to go for a walk and get out of the concentration that is uh, the houses. Um, I might, I only have two options. I can walk along the road to Fairgrounds Road and walk along kind of industrial part of the world. Um, or much more likely, I would go out the front gate nip across uh, the highway, dodging uh, cars going 80 kilometers, and enter uh, Blue Water. Now, Blue Water, <coughs> our community, is part of the Georgian Trails. Um, there is access to go in our front and then hang a right and go along Waterview and down the Cinder Path as part of the trail that runs from the west of Collingwood to these council chambers. Uh, where you would only ever be along the water. Although you'd pop out at, at uh, King Road, in Collingwood, you would go down um, the, um, the highway, the, the beachwood, beachwood, and you would enter through our front gates. So that meant that uh, the people across the road, there'd be a thousand of them um, or so, um, would probably be coming across the street and through our neighborhood and down around the corner. Um, and of course, there's a beach or water. There's not a beach. There's water, which uh, which is conservation land. Um, and it'd be terribly tempting to to nip through or between some of the houses and try and and um, and um, be out there. So um, it's for uh, the the uh, blue water community. We are uh, very afraid of this development. Uh, just the numbers. Um, we don't mind, and we are certainly <coughs> not opposed to um, affordable housing because we um, have personal experience with the challenges of people trying to find affordable housing, housing in Collingwood and Wasega Beach. And certainly people in the service industry that, that don't have the wherewithal to buy million dollar homes um, need places to live. So we understand that. So. Um, so, but we're, we're challenged with the density which the, the, the representative from, from the uh, consulting firm has said is at its maximum for what we can do. So, <coughs> so we would, we would, we would hope that council, um, in their consideration of the site plan, which has not been approved yet, of course, um, and the, the, the desire for a community which, at this point, you need a car to get around. You can't go anywhere from there. You, you, you know, they've done the traffic um, um, study, and uh, they had someone sit by the side of the road and found that very few people walked across the intersections at Fairgrounds Road because 
there are very few houses. And the reason that only one did in the time that they were watching is that everybody has to have a car. So can you imagine 459 homes in an area half the size of Waterview where everyone has a car? And if you have a two-income family, you got two cars. So um, you, <coughs> we are hoping that uh, council makes a wise decision with regards to this proposed um, uh, project. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Madam Deputy Clerk. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Next speaker we have is Don Dunn, and I believe Tim Dunn will be coming up with her. Good morning, Don. Welcome. Good morning. Sorry, was it Tina? Tim. Tim and Don. Tim and Don. Good All morning, right. Don like the morning. All right. <laughs> morning, Mayor Smith. Good morning, Sunshine. And, uh, council members. <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. R very much appreciated. My name is Tim Dunn, as I've said. My wife, Don, and I will be sharing the podium with some concerns we have on this proposed zoning amendment um, that we're here to discuss. Uh, we also live in Blue Water on the Bay, as, as does Allen, very special community that I hope you, you are all familiar with, right across the street from this development. It's at the west end of town on the water side of Beechwood Road near the border between uh, Wasake and Collingwood. We moved here three years ago after a long search for a perfect retirement neighborhood. We've been coming to this neck of the woods for over 25 years and are very familiar with the area. We looked at Collingwood, Wasega Beach, went as far west as Thornbury, Laura Bay, and Meaford. We decided on Blue Water Community and have not looked back. This location on Georgian Bay looking over the protected shoreline made this a perfect choice, not to mention the welcoming community that now includes many precious friends and neighbors. There are not many places where your daily outdoor options include walking, hiking, cycling, golf, skiing, or swimming in the largest, longest freshwater beach in the world. Our three grown children, our four grandchildren, and our four-year-old golden retriever all approve. As imports from the GTA, we feel like we've found a hidden gem with the beautiful balance of nature, community, and services. That's why we're very concerned and protective, but not surprised at the news at the proposed zoning amendment bylaw asking for these density changes. We are not aware of any property in town where such intensive development is proposed. We're certainly personally affected. We actually saw our house on the plan. If this project goes ahead as planned, we will enjoy a direct unobstructed view from our front porch of at least one, if not more, of the proposed four five-story towers. So anyways, um, I would like to address uh, uh, some of the concerns. I know Alan has already uh, stated um, some of the major concerns. Uh, so I'll try not to duplicate uh, effort here. Um, first of all, uh, we're concerned about the environmental impact. I know studies have been done on the property itself, but uh, beyond the borders of the proposed development, we're concerned uh, about a few things. Um, how is the noise from the ventilation systems of these uh, four um, higher, um, higher buildings, how are their handling systems on the rooftop going to negatively affect some of the nature around us? We have significant bird and wildlife population. Uh, in fact, our community, just adjacent to this community, um, is the, our shoreline and just to the east of us is designated as a natural heritage site. So uh, that is very controlled in terms of what we can do. Um, every morning uh, we, we walk uh, with our dog and we see beautiful populations of swans, geese, um, uh, and, and ducks. Uh, the whole gambit out there. So we're concerned firstly about the noise. Um, in addition uh, to possible loss of habitat, both on the site uh, during construction. I, I know it's been addressed uh, uh, a little bit in the open space that it has been identified as a wetland, uh, but how will that space be affected during construction and how will the existing populations be uh, protected for 
after development as well. Um, also, uh, with all of this massive, intensive development, how is all of this light pollution going to affect the bird life and the nesting habits of the habitat around us? So um, that kind of covers off some of the environmental impacts. Uh, Alan's addressed uh, the height of the tower buildings and their proximity to our properties. Uh, literally, if these buildings go up, we'll have full-on view um, of the buildings, and we're not impacted nearly as much as many of the other residents that back on Beechwood Road. Um, I know the shadow study has been completed, uh, but it still does uh, show that during the darkest months of the year, uh, many, many uh, of our neighbours are going to be uh, very affected. In addition, uh, those buildings, I know they'll probably be beautiful in the end, but they are a physical barrier and will prove to be an, a visual eyesore for, for people in the area, existing residents. And it, the physical barriers really um, is what is encroaching on the privacy um, of, of our uh, residents. Uh, I don't know how many of you head into Collingwood time and time again, you know, once in a while, but just over the past year, a mammoth five-story plus a roof condo is being to the terminal road there in front of the museum, and it is horrendous. It is uh, just like a physical barrier to the rest of the community. So I'm not sure if this is what you want for our town. Uh, so privacy issues have been addressed, um, traffic concerns have been addressed, um, you know, we're very proximate to Beechwood, uh, even with the Highway 26 uh, bypass, uh, Beechwood has really become the unofficial speedway uh, for those traveling between Collingwood and Wasaga Beach. And with the addition of another potential thousand cars, thousand trips, whatever has been looked at, uh, it's just going to create huge, um, uh, huge impact to the area, and even make, uh, even making uh, it hazardous to be turning out onto Beechwood Road uh, during peak hours and and during the very poor weather conditions that we often experience, uh, being exposed directly to Georgian Bay. We get a lot of whiteouts, snow, just like everybody. We we know what it's like. So um, whatever plan is in place. Uh, we would like you to consider um, uh, some options uh, that you know we we've discussed, but uh, maybe it could be looked at as part of the site planning. Some of the been, some of those ideas have been touched on. Uh, uh, perhaps reduce the height of the condo towers to three stories. Uh, perhaps set them back to the south side of the property, away from the existing R1 properties, and or replace them with a medium density uh, solution instead of the very high uh, density that is so not keeping with our community. Um, secondly, if you could, uh, if the engineering department could look at a pre-development traffic study to examine what the existing volumes are and the patterns and propose some viable solutions for during and after construction. Uh, consider making Fairgrounds Road the primary access uh, during construction and potentially after construction and uh, consider adding traffic lights or other controls at the Blue Water Gate uh, that's across from the uh, new development access road. In addition, uh, it might be considered because of our privacy concerns and populations perhaps wanting to seek out uh, waterfront, we suggest uh, considering rerouting Shore Lane Trail to Constance Boulevard so that anyone coming uh, from the west uh, would go down through uh, public roads and go safely along the trail. And just uh, please uh, respectfully rethink the rezoning application until such a time that uh, the West Wasaga Beach development plans have been reviewed and discussed in full with all partners and with full public consultation. I know at this time, um, and I understand that there's going to be a presentation afterwards about uh, looking at a, a redraft of our official plan. 
and also plans for our west end of Wasaga, which have been quite neglected, quite frankly, uh, over the years. So I think maybe we're taking the cart for the horse in terms of uh, committing to such high density proposal, given that all the other planning uh, work has not uh, been consulted with the public. So in conclusion, if approved, this, this zoning amendment will fundamentally change the fabric and feel of this community and set a negative precedent for transforming the entire West End, as Tom's talking about. We all have concerns about how this multi and high density development will impact our lives and properties and our precious environment. We know and appreciate that development and change is inevitable. We're, we're not, we're not, we, we understand that. However, let's do it smartly and respectfully. Thank you all for listening. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Don Thank and you. Kim. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't know, uh, did staff or the uh, developments consultants wish to respond to any of this today or taking your notes for later? Okay. All right, Madam Deputy Clerk. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. There are no other speakers registered. All right, thank you very much. Um, before we move on, I will just ask if there is anyone else in the audience who would like to come forward to speak to this matter. If so, please do and state your name and address for the record. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mayor Smith. Thank you for allowing us uh, the time to, to talk to you. Uh, my name is Rick Ostafi. I live at 73 Waterview Road, also across the street from this proposed development. I've understood that there's a, a need for more housing has been addressed. And the proposed high-rise buildings are all facing Beechwood. Is there something that requires that be there as opposed to placing it at the south end if you're going to go ahead with five-story buildings? Why not place it at the south end of your proposed development where it does not impact the view of all the people that back onto Beechwood Road? Any, any other questions? We'll, we'll answer your questions when you're and done. That, and that is my concern is why does it have to be on Beechwood? If you're going to have five stories, why aren't they at the south end of that, build, of that development? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll look to uh, Corey. Thank you, and, and thank you for that uh, comment. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the, the site was subject to uh, official site-specific official plan policies uh, quite some time ago, which set that high density area along Beechwood Drive. So the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to uh, implement uh, that vision. Um, if we were to uh, adjust them to the south end of the property, uh, I suspect it would necessitate an official plan amendment as well uh, to implement that change. Um, Generally speaking, uh, from an urban design perspective, and, and there's a lot of growth coming to not just Wasaika Beach, but the, the entire uh, area, um, we see uh, official plans being updated uh, in different municipalities, looking at ways how best to accommodate uh, the intensification that's required uh, in order to accommodate the growth that's uh, been projected to the area from the province. Um, typically, intensification is uh, uh, focused in downtown areas uh, as well as along major uh, collector roads. Uh, so um, typically the, the higher built form is located along the higher order roads and then kind of stepping down as we move away from the road. So um, I suspect uh, that was some of the thought process when that high density area was located uh, along Beachwood Road historically. All right, thank you very much. I'll ask uh, if there's anyone else who wishes to come forward, please do. Uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Brenda Armstrong, and I live at 42 Starboard. And am I shouting too loudly? No, okay. We hear you loud and clear. <laughs> one of my big concerns is not one that I really have, but a lot of people do have in Blue Water, and it's the drainage. And I myself, talk to a lot of people about the drainage in there. I happen to sell real estate, and I get very concerned for people when they move in and they have a problem with their backyard. A lot of issues have started when there was digging done across the road. I know that you tried to fix them, 
with a different drainage around the ditch behind leeward, but it's still a big issue and we're all afraid it's going to get worse. So I just want to ask if there's somebody that would talk to people in our development once they are starting to work on the, the drainage, because that is a huge issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments here from staff or uh, uh, Trevor, did you want to speak to this? Or Kevin? Certainly, I think, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I believe there was some maintenance performed along the roadside ditch along Beechwood Road by the MTO. Uh, so this isn't municipal jurisdiction, so we would not have performed any of the maintenance. So uh, that's, uh, to, to my knowledge, that's, that's where that drainage uh, works were done. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, that is true. That was done, but it really didn't fix anything. And I went through all the different se sessions that I could, all the different people I could, and got nowhere. So I just want to make sure it doesn't get worse. That's all. Thank you. Trevor? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, what we can do is uh, have the uh, developers uh, consultants there is a, probably a functional servicing report and a drainage plan that's available to the public. And what we can do is maybe uh, Corey or Candace and I can speak uh, to see if we can uh, have a, a discussion with uh, the resident about how the drainage is going to function for the development itself. Okay, that would be fair. All right, someone else wishes to come forward, please do. Good morning, please state your name and address for the record. I'm Karen Fuller. I live at <clears throat> 69 Waterview Road, also across the street from the proposed development. Uh, I just want to piggyback on a couple of comments that <clears throat> were made, and I think Alan certainly, in his description of what it would be like to live across the street, particularly if you have a young family, or if you just like to get outdoors, where are you going to go? Well, you are going to go to Blue Water. You are going to go to our community because the lake is a draw. And there is also currently an open invitation to enter our community because the trail runs through it. And uh, Don's uh, comment about rerouting that down to Constance would help with that. But right now, it is a wide open invitation to the thousand people plus, or whatever number, who live there to come into our community. They have the right to do it. They don't actually, but because it's private owned roads from what we, we maintain those roads but with the trail there we already have large group of cyclists coming through I'm a cyclist I get it I like the trail system we have a clubhouse and we have people who like to stop and have picnics at our gazebo <clears throat> we have no washroom facilities there so sometimes we have people taking a whiz on the rocks so uh, hopefully the people across the street would go home, but uh, that's, that's my biggest concern is, is just how do you control? We're not NIMBYs. I, I, I think everybody in our community gets that uh, we need more housing in, in uh, Wasaga Beach, that it's an issue. However, uh, there are some very, very practical problems. We don't want to be policing people coming into our community and stopping by and having picnics at our gazebo. And it is a large number of people. It's not 200 people. It's, it's a very large number of people. So at a very minimum, I would beg you to move that trail and stop the open invitation to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> All right, I'll ask a final time if there's anyone else who wishes to come forward, make a comment, uh, or ask a question about this proposal. All right, seeing none, I'll now turn to members of council for questions or comments. Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, Worship, through you. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, thank you very much for all the speakers and all the participation today. Uh, this is very helpful. Um, in regards to Alan's comment about the one car parking, I share the same concern. Uh, the cost of housing today requires, um, you know, two working people at times and or two active retiree people. And I agree that with the location of this property and this development, uh, so I would encourage this developer and, and forthcoming developers to really consider um, accommodating for two vehicles uh, per unit. 
Otherwise, you're just going to see the traffic and the parking spill into the arteries and the, and the inner streets, which is going to make a, a con even more condensed area. I also uh, agree with the comment in regards to the playground. Um, this is a busy, quick moving road um, adjacent to this development and, and a playground I, I feel inside that green space is essential. Um, and uh, to the uh, director, um, Kevin, ability of rerouting that trail, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that specifically, but is that an option? Please. Uh, thank you through you, Your Worship. It, it's, it would certainly be something we could consider subject to council's direction. I know when that subdivision was established in the early 2000s, that was a condition of draft plan approval was to establish public walkways through uh, that development to facilitate trail access as close to the waterfront as possible. So it would uh, require uh, a review of that. Hey, Deputy Mayor Snow. Thank you, Your Worship. Just as a quick follow-up. Um, I would like to put forward the request uh, for from council direction to staff to just explore what are the options of being able to reroute that trail um, given the potential the, the, the forthcoming we know um, amount of development in the West End if that could be reviewed and brought back to council for consideration. Madam Clerk some procedure on that. Thank you your worship. Um, I would ask that we uh, bring that up at council request to staff reports in the agenda further in the agenda. Thank you your worship. Thank you Madam Clerk. Anything else uh, Deputy Mayor Snell? All right now uh, the next was Councillor Eagle. Thank you and through you your worship. Um, thank you Corey for the presentation and to the residents that have come out and spoken today. Certainly appreciate it. Um, my one question to Corey is, is what is your target market? Who, who are you looking to sell these to? Please. Thank you uh, for the question, Councillor. Um, I'd have to take that back to our, our client, but just from my experience with similar types of uh, developments where we're proposing uh, generally smaller uh, types of units, both with the apartments and the uh, townhouses and stacked townhouses. It tends to be a mix. There's the component of young families and first-time home buyers. Uh, typically these units are more affordable than a single detached dwelling just by the nature of their reduced size and, and land area. Um, but we also see a lot of um, uh, either retirees or empty nesters that are looking to downsize from uh, perhaps living in a single detached dwelling their kids have gone off to school or moved out and they're looking to, to downsize. So in my experience, it's a bit of a combination of, of the two when we're looking at these smaller units uh, that's typically a lower price point and, and you get the mix of, of kind of younger families, first time home buyers and, and people downsizing. Okay, thank you. Um, to continue, um, this council, we're looking to do really complete neighborhoods. That's a really big priority of ours. And I see this right now as just a pod of maximum density, which doesn't really seem to work with our plan. So recently, we, we've, you know, had different proposals in here, and one came to mind, or came to us, and it was a more Sorry, account, a mixed Sorry, Councillor, I've got to stop oh. you. We want to make sure that we're staying on topic to this development, okay. uh, as it is a public meeting. All right. It's just considering maybe more a mixed use. As I said, I don't see the playground, place for children. Um, so, so that's what I feel is definitely lacking there and all these other comments have been made. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Uh, we'll certainly take that back. Um, just to the green space uh, central to the site, uh, it is fairly uh, large in size. I believe it is over two acres. Um, a detailed landscape plan hasn't been prepared yet, so that would be done at site plan approval. That's why it is just shown kind of as, as plain green there. Um, but certainly take that back. We've heard that comment from a number of people. I think it's a good comment. Thanks. All right, thank you. Councillor Belanger. Thank you. Uh, through you, the Mayor. Uh, just a, a couple of quick things. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, the indication of the historical location of the high density, uh, I, I haven't uh, seen the details of the, the new official plan or whether there's any option to have flexibility as to where that's located on the site. And al along with that, it, obviously, if it uh, moved to uh, what you're called south, I 
sort of think it more west to the fairground roads, but maybe that's south. But similar to uh, the, the housing in Zoo Park where uh, we did the stairwells at the end of the building so that uh, the, the people that are actually living in the units weren't constantly uh, looking out at another development, whether uh, that could be a, a consideration uh, because that, uh, I think that was uh, uh, pleasing to the neighbor uh, over on, uh, well, what's, the, what's the road there? Anyhow. Wally? Wally Road, yes, thank you. And then the other thing that uh, was just touched on, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's this development specific, uh, but in, uh, in the development in general in the West End, uh, there has been talk about it being part of the solution to the drainage problems uh, in Blue Water and beyond. I know uh, when we were uh, canvassing out in that area, uh, going back uh, even eight years, uh, many uh, of the neighbors on uh, bordering on uh, Beechwood Road were complaining about drainage issues in their backyards. And uh, Kevin, I'm not sure if it's this development specific with the, with the pond that's uh, shown there or whether it's one further to the south, but uh, I know there is plans to improve the drainage through this uh, development process that's going on in the West End. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Um, thank you, Councillor Belanger, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, the drainage uh, assessment that's currently underway is more focused uh, east of the subject development. Um, so it includes George, Marilyn, Robert, Beechwood Road, um, and east of Robert Street. Uh, so it's, it's not specific to uh, the roadside drainage along Beechwood and it doesn't speak to groundwater table as well. Thank you, Councillor Bonger. Councillor DeLeo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. I'm gonna echo what Councillor Belanger said, and I agree with the residences regarding five-story buildings being right on Beach, Beachwood. Is there any way that you would consider amending your site plans to put them on the south side so that at least you know, it doesn't block their, their sun? Or I'm going to uh, look to our CAO there for an answer to that. Yeah, sorry, I, I just wanted to clarify. This is supposed to be for questions. Um, the council will consider the application at a future date, so I would urge council to refrain from offering comments on the actual what, what's before you today. This is really just clarification questions. Um, but I think, the, I think the question here is what they considered. I think the issue is the official plan as it is today um, doesn't allow these buildings to be at the back of the property. Although we probably all may agree on this and the developer um, probably would prefer that as well. It would save a lot of headaches for them, but currently. So I think that the report will come back to council. We can ask those questions and uh, it's one of my questions as well, uh, members of council. Uh, so we uh, we can uh, we'll get that information back to us before we make a decision. Anything further, Councillor DeLeo? Thank you, Mr. CAO. Councillor Timms. Thank you, Your Worship. Most of my concerns have been answered, but I do want to uh, ask a question to Trevor. Um, is it likely that the official plan and this um, uh, rezoning application, etc., will come together efficiently? So I think one of the residents mentioned that today, that uh, uh, if um, the public meetings for the OP could take place, it might speak to a lot of these concerns that we're hearing. Trevor? So uh, to answer the question, I think uh, we have a large grocery list of questions and answers that council and the public would like. I will not speak to Corey and how quickly he would like to redress to them because uh, we will be asking them to prepare us a response matrix if and when we come back with a staff report. So um, I don't know if Corey wants to speak to it, but uh, generally speaking, I would find that it would probably be at least a month or two or if not more before we would be able to have a presentation or a staff report back to council on this particular application. All right, thank you, Corey. Do you wish to speak to that at all? 
Uh, yeah, I, we received a number of comments both today and, and in the last few days, comments have been trickling in from different town departments and outside agencies. So um, I suspect it will be uh, at least a month or two before we'd be in a position to, to come back in with a, a resubmission. But there's a lot of factors to that, so I can't give you an unequivocal answer today. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. Uh, I just have a few. Uh, I'll echo a couple. Um, well, I guess I'll rephrase my first question, and that is if the official plan uh, was to be changed, uh, I, one thing I would like to hear back from uh, the developer is that if that was the case, if they would consider moving these buildings further back on the property or rezoning perhaps take place to do that. Um, and, um, you know, I think what's important to note here today, uh, I've done a few of these public meetings, uh, and I want to compliment the residents uh, of this area because they haven't come forth like we see often, and this is not a this is not a jab at any resident because when something's happening in your immediate neighborhood, including myself or anyone else, of course your uh, thoughts and feelings are heightened. But these residents have been very amicable, and I think they've asked very reasonable questions. Uh, I haven't heard one resident to say here today to say this shouldn't occur. What I've heard is that you know we need to have a lot of questions answered. Uh, and we uh, would hope that the municipality and uh, or the developer would uh, work with us a little better in order to make this a, a, a new community that will blend better with the community that's there. And I, I commend you uh, folks for that, so thank you. Um, Council has a, a lot of uh, questions, I'm sure. Uh, staff have uh, heard all the questions, as has Corey and his team, and uh, I assume this is, uh, as you've indicated, is going to be a few months uh, before this comes back, uh, and it will come back to Council. Um, uh, the shadow study that was done, I, we heard today that at some point throughout the day that did show uh, that there would be shade on uh, the residents who are currently there today. So I'd like to get a little more information uh, for Council on that when it comes back so we can understand that clearly. Um, rerouting the trail, as uh, Deputy Mayor has uh, pointed out that was brought up a couple of times today and and if that can be done how can that be done and and what is the cost uh, if any to the municipality to do that uh, i'd like to see some information on that uh, drainage uh, in this whole area our, our uh, general manager um, for public works is uh, oh too well aware of the drainage issues along uh, old highway 26 and uh, so clearly uh, we're hearing that this goes a little further perhaps and and uh, some more information for Council's consideration when it comes back uh, with respect to that as well. Um, other than that, uh, I think uh, we've had a good meeting. Uh, again, thank you to the folks uh, from the area for coming out. We truly appreciate it. I uh, had a conversation with uh, a couple of members from there, and, and uh, you know, I indicated the best way to, to deal with this is to come out and let your voice be heard. And so we appreciate that. And uh, uh, with that, we will adjourn this public meeting. Madam Clerk, I think we're going to take a 10 minute uh, break uh, and we'll come back at uh, 5 after. Let's make it a 13 minute break, minute break, and we'll come back at 5 after. Thank you, yes. And anyone in the audience that wants notifications on this planning matter, please sign the sign in sheet uh, over with okay. the Deputy Clerk. Sorry, folks. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the, the clerk was just mentioning that anyone who wants any notifications or further information uh, on this development, to please make sure you sign up uh, with uh, the deputy clerk or in one of our sheets there so as that uh, we ensure you do get that information. And for any of your neighbors who have left, if you could let them know to call us and let us know, that would be great. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll take a 10-minute break, come back at 5 after.
through your worship. We're live. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk. And we'll now uh, call this meeting back to order. Uh, we're on to item number seven of the agenda, which is presentations, uh, the new official plan update. And Matt Ellis, our planner, planner is here today to present. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Mayor Smith, members of council, our friends from GSP group, Patrick Casey and Steve Weaver, who are in the audience, our local media, uh, anybody in the audience, and anybody tuning in on our live stream. So our official plan, uh, the town of Wasaga Beach, um, we've consistently um, been one of the fastest growing communities in Canada over the past number of decades. Uh, starting and going back to the 1991 census, uh, we were a population of 6,457. We've grown to 24,862 in the 2021 census. Obviously, we're still growing, and that uh, trend is anticipated to continue uh, upwards to 50,000 permanent residents by 2051. What's going on here? Oh. You gotta push the right, not the bottom. Oh, okay. All right, there we go. So uh, the official plan is this big, long document um, for anybody uh, tuning in on our live stream or in the audience that um, doesn't exactly know what the official plan is. I'll just give a quick overview. The official plan is mandated by the Ontario Planning Act. It outlines a community's long-term vision of 30 years or beyond uh, for growth and improvement, identifying where, when, and how different types of growth will occur. It prescribes policies for growth management, um, population and housing, employment, uh, tourism and economic development, infrastructure, environmental protection, and public health and safety. Bylaws passed and all public works undertaken by the town are required to conform to the official plan. Our current official plan was adopted by Town Council in September of 2003 and was approved by the County of Simcoe in 2004. Uh, we've seen uh, quite significant population growth uh, since that time, growing by over 65%. We are rapidly growing from a primarily tourism-focused community uh, to a more balanced and complete urban network. Other changes that we have seen since then are an increased need for more affordable housing and diverse housing options, uh, an aging population with a corresponding need for age-friendly development and higher quality urban design, uh, recognition of importance of sustainability and climate change, adaptation and mitigation, uh, shifts in a local economic landscape, evolution in communications technology and planning best practices. And we've also seen uh, quite extensive changes to provincial planning legislation and policy. And all these changes uh, mean that our current official plan requires a complete overhaul uh, to ensure that our town is effectively planned for the future. The project to uh, replace our current official plan with a new official plan uh, commenced uh, a number of years ago in 2017. A GSP group, as I mentioned, represented by Steve Weaver and Patrick Casey, uh, is retained as our lead consultant, supported by NBLC and Curtis Planning. The release of the first draft is anticipated uh, this spring. Uh, once released, um, town planning staff and GSP group will re-engage with um, stakeholders, including staff from other town departments, the County of Simcoe, uh, Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority, other affected agencies, and Indigenous communities. Phase one uh, of the official plan um, review or update project uh, started with background research, consultation, and completion of topic-specific uh, discussion papers. We are now in the early stages of phase two which is drafting the official plan. And uh, as mentioned, uh, we do intend to release that uh, in the coming months. Uh, this, uh, after release of the official plan, uh, we will, of course, re-engage with uh, community stakeholders. 
discussion papers as part of phase one include a growth management discussion paper, a commercial retail and tourism discussion paper, and a community engagement and cons um, consultation summer, summary report. Activities uh, as part of um, our consultation in phase one include consultation with First Nations, uh, specifically here on Wendat Nation, consultation with the County of Simcoe and applicable provincial agencies, consultation with stakeholder focus groups, consultation with other uh, Town of Wasaga Beach staff, a public meeting, job and information session and visiting workshop, a youth center consultation, and inflate a fest uh, pop-up booth consultation. Uh, pictures on this slide. Um, the uh, middle picture, as you can see in the, with the bouncy castles in the background, uh, would have been at the inflate a fest. And the other two pictures are from our drop-in session and community visioning workshop. Comments that we've heard during phase one uh, are summarized in six uh, main groups. And I'll just go through those uh, briefly here. Uh, pursuing more housing options. Our community is seeking an increased range of housing options for first time home buyers, workers, families, and older adults. Uh, this includes a desire for more rental options and additional dwelling units. More compact mixed use communities. Uh, our community, our residents are seeking opportunities within walkable and complete neighborhoods. And that uh, also goes hand in hand with environmental protection uh, as development in more compact uh, communities uh, means that uh, we are, are more able to preserve uh, woodlands, wetlands, and other natural treat areas for future generations and visitors. Enhanced public space opportunities with new indoor and outdoor venues for events, classes, uh, trails, and other community functions uh, that should be equitably distributed um, among neighborhoods. More transportation options uh, so as to minimize the need to travel long distances to obtain daily needs. And this also goes hand in hand with more compact uh, mixed use communities as those types of communities make uh, transportation options such as public transit uh, more viable. Pursue more employment uses with flexible land use designations uh, concentrated around nodes, and I'll get uh, I'll get into nodes uh, later in this presentation. And uh, those land use designations um, are encouraged to support economic diversification and job creation. And pursuing more year-round tourism attractions um, with necess necessary support infrastructure such as quality hotels for overnight and longer term stays. The town's official plan is just one piece of a much broader uh, provincial, regional, and municipal planning framework. So in this, the graphic in this slide um, divides these uh, policy instruments in those levels of government. So at the top we have uh, the Planning Act the Planning Act um, outlines, um, well, the, the Planning Act, in addition to requiring the town to do an official plan, also gives the town the authority to adopt the official plan. The Act outlines matters of provincial interest that must be addressed when updating the official plan, as well as uh, in the review of uh, development applications. This list is uh, quite extensive and includes matters such as environmental protection, protection of agriculture and resource lands, conservation of natural resources and cultural features, uh, protection of public health and safety, sustainable development and, ad and adequate provisions of housing, employment opportunities, the appropriate location for growth and development, uh, mitigation of greenhouse gases and adaptation to climate change. Uh, the act also authorizes the, the municipal affairs and housing, or the minister, to issue policy statements which address matters of provincial interest in greater detail. These policy statements are the provincial policy, sorry, provincial policy statement, or PPS, and a place to grow uh, growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which we affectionately refer to as the growth plan. 
The provincial policy statement provides further direction on land use planning matters of provincial interest. The current uh, version of the PPS came into effect in May of 2020 and includes policies relating to building strong and healthy communities, wise, wise use and management of resources and protecting public health, public health and safety. The growth plan um, came into, a, the current uh, iteration of the growth plan came into effect in August 2020. It builds upon the GP, it builds upon the PPS by providing specific direction on managing growth within uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Um, the growth plan was first enacted in 2005. Amendment 1 of the growth plan came into force in 2012 to establish the County of Simcoe, referred to as the, referred to as the Simcoe sub-area, with specific policies that pertain to municipalities within Simcoe County. The county, excluding the cities of Barrie and Aurelia, is assigned a target of 555,000 persons and 198,000 jobs by 2051. This target is divided amongst the county's 16 lower tier municipalities, excluding Barrie and Aurelia in the Simcoe County official plan. By providing further direction on the locations for growth, the growth plan creates a foundation for municipalities to align infrastructure investments with growth management, optim optimize the use of existing and planned infrastructure, promote green infrastructure. Uh, the growth plan requires that the majority of forecasted growth be directed to settlement areas that have a built up boundary, that have existing and planned uh, water and sewer infrastructure, and can support the uh, achievement of complete communities. The Simcoe County official plan um, was adopted by the county on November 25, 2008, and it was partially approved by the former Ontario Municipal Board, now the Ontario Land Tribunal, in April 2013. Since that time, it has been approved in phases, with the final phase coming into f coming into f full force and effect in December 2016. The Simcoe County Official Plan delineates settlement areas that lower tier municipalities are required to adopt. Uh, for the town of Wasagi Beach, our settlement area coincides with our municipal boundary. The Simcoe County Official Plan requires lower tier, lower tier municipalities in their official plans to establish planning strategies and policies that are consistent with the PPS and the growth plan, and obviously the Simcoe, Simcoe County official plan. The recently adopted Simcoe County official plan amendment number seven, or as we refer to it as SCOPA seven, uh, that is awaiting final approval uh, from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, assigns the town of Wasagi Beach a population of 38,090 persons and 8,510 jobs by 2051. However, given historical growth trends and developments that are currently in the approval process, the town estimates that within this 2051 planning horizon, we will grow up to uh, 50,000 persons. The policies of the Simcoe County Official Plan instruct lower tier municipalities to consult with the county during the preparation of their official plans to ensure compatibility with the goals, objectives, and policies within that official plan. County staff will be uh, directly involved in the formulation of the town's official plan. Now we come to our town of Wasaga Beach official plan. As stated earlier, uh, the official plan outlines the town's long-term vision. It outlines uh, where growth is to occur, where land uses are to be generally located, for example, neighborhood areas, commercial areas, uh, mixed use areas, and how development applications are reviewed. Land use designations are based on larger areas of town, uh, more general than the zoning bylaw. So for example, the official plan will designate which areas are neighborhood, uh, and that will include a mixed uh, use um, or mixed density um, housing, uh, local commercial uses such as like convenience stores, things like that, and institutional uses such as schools and places of worship. The town of Wasagi Beach zoning bylaw implements the official plan. 
and gets more into the nuts and bolts uh, with things like setbacks, maximum heights, and uh, will zone uh, areas on a more granular basis, on a more property property um, type basis. So conceptually, think of the official plan as a big picture, high level, um, kind of whole of stuff. The official and the zoning bylaw uh, gets into the nuts and bolts. The economic, environmental, and social forces that have influenced the policy direction of the official plan, we call these the key drivers of change. So as illustrated in this um, graphic here, uh, these forces um, can be thought of separately, but they also co they're also interrelated, uh, coalescing into an overall mosaic, or in some cases, a perfect storm of forces. These next slides will summarize each of these drivers of change. Starting with rapid growth, I'll reuse a graphic from a previous slide. Uh, we've grown, um, obviously, quite rapidly over the last several decades. Uh, and we included a trend line with this graphic and uh, with, uh, represented by the solid line. As represented by the dotted line, we anticipate growing upwards of upwards to 50,000 people by 2051. Uh, we are within a 1.5 hour commute of Toronto, which places Wasaga Beach within the commuter shed of the GTA. As a result, and this gets into our next graphic, uh, seniors and families uh, seek more affordable housing opportunities in amenity rich uh, smaller communities and are choosing to relocate to Wasaga Beach so that uh, they may enjoy a higher quality of life. So our two um, main um, demographic uh, groups in the town are uh, young seniors uh, between 60 and 79 and young families between 20 and 39 uh, represented by the uh, two biggest arrows in the graphics and the other demographic groups are the smaller arrows. Housing affordability. Um, currently, 83% of our housing stock is uh, single family dwellings. And we have a few um, duplexes uh, mixed in there too. Uh, Wasaga Beach um, is experiencing a number of significant challenges which underscore the need to provide a more fulsome range of dwelling types. Uh, this includes more affordable housing um, options and designs that are age friendly. In 2021, 20% of owner households and 60% of rental households were experiencing housing adequacy, suitability and affordability challenges. The percentage of our older population um, has also increased. So as we have primarily housing on the in the pictures on the right side, or sorry, on the left side of the slide. What we need is more housing uh, in these pictures on the right side. This includes gentle densities such as uh, townhouses in walkable and cycling friendly communities and mid-rise apartment buildings. The official plan uh, will include policies to, pr to promote and support the provision of a complete housing mix that responds to the dif different characteristics and needs of people throughout their lifetimes, including such factors as health and accessibility needs, household income levels, and family household size and composition. In addition to these issues, as tourism is the backbone of Wasega's economy, a significant number of residents are employed in lower paying service related jobs and this uh, makes it difficult for employees to compete for housing options and many are unfortunately priced out of our market. The global climate emergency, issues around sustainability, climate change and protection of the national environment have come to the forefront of public policy as society has come to better understand the interrelatedness of human activities in the natural environment and having have experienced increases in the frequency of extreme weather events. Some of us may remember uh, some um, weather events such as uh, 
the area that we affectionately know as the main end uh, being flooded out a few years ago. And uh, this has resulted in um, a ton of sand uh, being uh, deposited onto Beach Drive and our town had to spend tons of money uh, with our public works um, crews removing the tons of sand that have been deposited as well as uh, illustrated in the bottom picture uh, flooding in the west end of Wasaga Beach around the Beachwood Road area, uh, Constance Boulevard, uh, Maryland and Robert and George Streets. Um, so unfortunately these events are going to become more uh, more frequent with climate change. So our official plan will be deliberate in promoting technologies uh, such as EV charging stations, uh, stormwater uh, management solutions, and uh, green roofs um, complemented with uh, renewable energy such as solar panels. And those are um, illustrated in the pictures on the right hand side of the slide. Focus on place quality. Um, as a resident of Wasaga Beach, I, uh, I know that uh, we are quite blessed um, to uh, have amazing natural resources, including the Nottawasaga River, um, as it, uh, evidenced in the bottom picture, uh, taken at the uh, Oxbow on top of the um, sand bank. Uh, and we have our, uh, the world's longest freshwater beach Unfortunately, uh, what we lack today are uh, walkable, vibrant, mixed-use centers. Uh, providing these interesting urban places is particularly relevant when we look at ways uh, to attract investment and retain residents, uh, particularly younger residents. So what we need is um, uh, more centers such as the pictures on the right-hand side. Um, if we do not provide these types of environments or the ability to live in these types of places, then those who seek them out will uh, pursue to live elsewhere. Downtown revitalization. Um, at one point, um, before my time, in the 1950s, uh, we used to have a downtown. Uh, these pictures is taken from our archives. Um, show uh, some old cars in a very uh, bustling place and some old Model Ts and cars that look like Al Capone probably drove in the 1950s. Um, unfortunately, because of uh, the green field sprawling types of development that we've seen, uh, our downtown area has developed into a kind of a barren sort of landscape. The pictures in the center of this slide are uh, Google Street View pictures uh, showing um, the Main Street area in the top picture and the Mosley Street area next to the Playland parking lot in the bottom picture. Um, our official plan will uh, carry forward the vision of the downtown master plan as uh, shown in the top two pictures on the right hand side uh, to facilitate the development of uh, a downtown such as in the bottom picture. Uh, this will be important to um, facilitate economic development in the downtown. From an infrastructure perspective, uh, Wasegi Beach is uh, very well positioned uh, from a water and sewer capacity to accommodate future growth. Uh, these are examples of hard infrastructure such as our water treatment plant uh, at the end of Woodland Drive and our water towers um, on Sunnydale Road and our beach ball-like water tower off of uh, River Road West. However, um, we, are, um, we, we have gaps in soft infrastructure such as schools. Um, obviously, as uh, we see developments, um, people in those developments need places for their kids to go to school. Uh, examples of some things that we are doing uh, include the uh, partnership with the Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board with the uh, conceptual high school um, beside our new Wasega Stars Arena. Our official plan um, will aim to um, fill out um, those soft infrastructure gaps. Reversing out commuter trends. 
A uh, significant challenge identified through our community consultation as part of phase one, and this is substantiated by data from uh, Stats Canada, is the shortage of diverse and higher paying job opportunities within the town's, within the town's boundaries. Currently, the 70% of our residents that have a usual place to work leave our town each workday to work in area municipalities such as Collingwood, Barrie, the townships of Clearview and Essa, and in some cases, the GTA. Employment opportunities within the town also tend towards lower wage jobs in retail, accommodation and food services and construction rather than higher wage opportunities in education, professional, scientific and technical services and advanced manufacturing. In addition, Wasagi Beach is currently the largest municipality in Ontario without a high school. This results in approximately 1,000 high school aged children leaving our community each school day. The new official plan will seek to reverse uh, these trends. From a financial sustainability perspective, the, those um, sprawling uh, types of developments that I referred to earlier, um, such as um, these developments in these pictures on the left-hand side, and two of those pictures are uh, subdivisions in our town. Uh, the other picture is a picture from some other community in, in the U.S., but honestly, that could be pretty much any community in North America. Uh, these lower density type neighborhoods are more expensive to service with emergency services, water, sewer, streets, and hydro infrastructure, uh, parks and community centers, libraries, etc. Uh, than higher density neighborhoods. The new official plan will be very deliberate in seeking to direct growth towards mixed use neighborhoods such as in the picture on the right. This is to create a better balance between operating costs and municipal revenues. I stress that this does not mean tall buildings everywhere. Instead, it means directing growth to the areas that can best support it to maximize efficient use of town infrastructure while also, also pursuing a more diverse range and mix of housing types. In addition to reducing financial costs, smarter land use approaches that are contained within the new official plan will help to reduce energy consumption, decrease emissions, and promote healthier lifestyles. As mentioned, the GTA, uh, or as mentioned, we are within a 90 minute drive of the GTA. The GTA is the most diverse region in the world. As we are rapidly growing, uh, this means um, more diversity, including migration from the GTA and beyond. Our new official plan um, will celebrate this growing diversity and will strive to adapt to uh, community um, needs, um, key structures of our new official plan. In response to these uh, key drivers of change that were highlighted previously, land use designations and structuring elements uh, will be formulated to guide permissions, prohibitions, and uh, policies to adjust and support uh, complete neighborhoods in a vibrant downtown, achieve better infill intensification, uh, mixed use areas and densities, improve sustainability, climate resiliency, and building and uh, infrastructure practices, promote and enhancing the natural environment, ensure the efficient use of infra infrastructure, and secure higher quality employment and learning, learning opportunities. Our key part of uh, the new official plan um, will be to direct most intensification uh, to areas that we call strategic growth areas or SGAs. So strategic growth areas um, are comprised of nodes um, and corridors. Uh, nodes are key intersections around uh, where growth um, has concentrated or will concentrate with uh, commercial activity and higher density mm -hmm. residential land uses. And corridors are uh, key uh, road corridors uh, where this has occurred. These nodes and corridors together uh, 
or SGAs. A total of six SGAs um, have been identified, uh, starting with going from east to west, the Sunrise District uh, along uh, the River Road West corridor, approximately between Bells Park Road and Zoo Park Road, uh, the downtown, Old Mosley Village uh, along Mosley Street and Duncairn Avenue, uh, between 18th Street and 23rd Street, uh, Schooner Town, uh, the Mosley Street corridor between 24th and 39th Streets, Springhurst Junction, uh, Mosley Street and 45th Street, approximately between Puccini Drive and Knox Road West, and the Emerging Sunset District, uh, generally uh, around uh, the roundabouts with Highway 26 and Mosley Street, Lions Court, and Beach Road Road. The SGA policies uh, will be formulated to encourage compact, mixed-use, uh, walkable town centers in these SGAs. Uh, one thing that we've experienced uh, with our official plan um, that's nearly 20 years old is that amendments to, current, to the current official plan have resulted in a policy document that is unnecessarily complex and uncoordinated. As a result of its age, the current official plan does not reflect prevailing best practices, such as policies that, that promote uh, complete communities, complete streets, and response to climate change, and other community priorities and recent legislative changes. The new official plan will be a modern document, streamlined with reduced duplication and unnecessary details and formatted in a, man in a manner that improves ease of use for all stakeholders. One example is illustrated in this table here. Our current official plan on the left um, side of the table has a total of 26 land use districts. Uh, some of these are land use designations. Some of these designations are uh, simply unnecessary. Um, so in our new official plan, uh, we will remove some of these land use designations and consolidate, other, and consolidate others. Uh, we anticipate um, landing in around a total of 12 um, land use designations. After a review of, uh, term, after a review of the term of council priorities, the new official plan will be broadly consistent with most of the pr priorities under the categories of uh, pursuing complete streets, improving community parks and recreation, uh, pursuing housing for all, uh, growing tourism, improving the public realm, and pursuing green, green initiatives. C concluding remarks, as, um, as stated earlier, uh, the first draft is anticipated to be released uh, for public consumption uh, this spring. After that, we'll, we will re-engage with uh, the community and other stakeholders. And then uh, based on comments received, we'll come out with an early, we'll come out with a second draft in early summer 2004, and sorry, 2024. Um, then we'll review the second draft with a statutory open house and public meeting. And then we'll um, come forward to council in late summer, late this summer, hopefully, with a final official plan uh, for adoption, and then once it gets adopted, we'll ship that off to the county for uh, final approval. So um, to request the diff additional information on this um, project, um, residents can email uh, manager of planning, uh, Mark Bryan, who is also behind me. Uh, they can email myself. Um, and uh, everything uh, for this project, um, such as all supporting materials um, can be reviewed on the official plan review page of the Engage uh, Wasego website. And uh, thank you. And we're here to answer any questions as well as our uh, folks from GSP. Um, they can answer any questions uh, that are more of a technical matter that uh, staff is not able to answer. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, excellent report, very comprehensive. We appreciate that. Members of council, questions or comments? Councillor Belanger. Through you, the mayor. First of all, uh, uh, great work. Uh, the complexity of what you're dealing with, and again, uh, it's been a, a long time in, 
in coming to this update. So uh, I, th I think the general public uh, probably uh, uh, didn't have a good understanding of uh, how challenging it is to create a new official plan. And uh, so I compliment you on that and I look forward to the final because even as we see in all of these <coughs> development presentations, it's a, a little challenging for council when we're trying to balance what we know is coming to what is the current policy. So thank you. Uh, the, the, the only comment I have, because I, uh, this is very complex, is that recently uh, uh, Collingwood in, uh, made an adjustment to, to their official plan related to the main level of their downtown uh, to uh, uh, restrict uh, non-retail uses and uh, because I, I guess it was becoming more and more common to have, uh, you know, insurance offices and lawyers and everything, and they were losing uh, that uh, vitality of, of being a place for people to be and shop. And so I'm, I, I would just ask that we uh, consider doing something similar uh, as to when we finalize our uh, Main Street plans. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Belanchi. Uh, question, any questions, comments? Councillor Timms. Thank you, Your Worship. And, and not so much a, a question, but a comment. I'm constantly hearing from the community how concerning it is, uh, not just the out commuting um, and, and school busing, but also that we are losing folks of a certain demographic who cannot find a suitable place to live because of uh, um, accessibility needs or the, the need to downsize. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that we're going to look for housing for all. And uh, I did want to ask you how many jobs we currently have, but I think I saw that in your um, uh, presentation about 3,000 jobs in our community, and it, that even seems high to me, but uh, it must be uh, accurate. And I guess the only question I have, Your Honor, is how quickly can we get this in play because we need it so, uh, so importantly? Not a real question. <laughs> Not a real question? So you don't want an answer? <laughs> how about we get an answer anyway? <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Mayor Smith and Councillor Tim. Sorry, I didn't, um, I was flipping through the pages to get the employment data when you were asking so the, questions. So. The first question was about the amount of employment we have. Is it 3,000? Uh, is that accurate? Uh, and uh, number two uh, was how soon do you think this official plan can come into play? Uh, thank you. Uh, so the employment um, data, um, these, um, the table that we actually took from our um, I think that was from the uh, employment or our economic development strategy. It actually is, um, actually lists that we have just over 5,000 jobs uh, uh, for Wasaga Beach. Um, and that study was done around, was completed around, I think, 2021, um, just after I started here. And um, can I get the second question? Sure, Ken. Uh, when, do you, oh, when do you think or how quickly can this uh, be completed? Uh, we're anticipating uh, late summer. Did you want to add to that, Andrew? Yeah, just, just to uh, help the councillor understand the, the timelines. So the, the Planning Act actually has legislated timelines where you need to post and advertise this many days in advance, et cetera. So um, working back from summer, it actually is tight to get this approved by summer, but that, that's our goal is to have the official plan in front of council by summer. Um, with all the statutory requirements that we need to host public meetings, et cetera. Excellent. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments? Councillor Timms, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a follow-up. When I look at the timelines, it seems so uh, aggressive and optimistic, and, and particularly because we're already in spring 2024. So it would be great to see it early summer of this year, but uh, I know it's going to be a challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Timms. Councillor Ego. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Thank you, Matt. That was it's really interesting looking at it. So this is a one-on-one -on -one question. I understand some years ago we became a primary settlement area, the whole town of Wasaga Beach. Are we designated that? No. Oh, 
Uh, through Councillor uh, Eagle, no, um, we're we're not uh, currently designated as a, a PSA in the growth plan. So I think we are a settlement area, but not a primary settlement area. Andrew, did you want to Correct. add to that? Yeah, that that's a great question, and that's something that we've been trying to have happen here for many, many years. I recall way back to 2014, 2015 meeting with the province and making that request. Um, while it may not seem like a big deal, the word primary actually is a big deal. Um, and a lot of provincial investment flows to areas where there's the primary designation. So that's why we have asked uh, the minister to give consideration to adding that word in front of settlement area. Okay, thank you. And while we're on that then, is there also, can you have both or would you have like, we're basically a primary settlement area and then can you have a tourism area within a PSA and is it advantageous? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I, I, I don't, a tourism settlement area is not a technically defined planning term, uh, but you can absolutely have tourist zones and special districts within your community. So th there's no issue with, with doing that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think, I think we're undoubtedly a tourism area. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's no doubt about that. And uh, with the future plans, we'll be an even bigger and better tourism area. But primary settlement would be nice to have. And so, well, actually, I'll wait till it's my turn. Anyone else have questions or comments? It's my turn. So uh, I, I would ask that, uh, do we have any idea when we expect any kind of reply from the minister on that? Do you want to do that? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I think maybe um, uh, we'd have to revisit that. Uh, that did come up during my time as warden at uh, County Simcoe, and we were supportive of uh, being a preferred settlement area for Wasaga Beach. Uh, so I think maybe a revisit of that maybe would uh, reintroduce the conversation uh, politically back to the minister's office. But uh, from the technical uh, dot and the I's crossing the T's, I'll turn it over to Trevor to, to address that. Thank you, Mr. Deputy CAO. Mr. <coughs> Director. So, um, th through your worship, recall that we did a staff report to council about this time last year uh, regarding Bill 23 and all the other thousands of bills that have come through in the last week or so. Um, my recollection, and I stand to be corrected, um, and I don't, there is a new PPS that was launched yesterday. Uh, I'm not sure about the growth plan, but my recollection was is that the primary settlement areas was one of those things that the ministry was actually thinking about getting rid of and uh, the reason for that is tied to settlement population numbers and that the province for the county of Simcoe I'm talking of now was that uh, the local municipalities would right now we are bound by the the growth uh, the growth plan with <coughs> allocation set by the province one of the thoughts of the province was uh, we'll just simply get rid of primary settlement areas we'll get rid of uh, population caps and it will be up to the individual municipalities to come up with their own uh, growth numbers so it, we have asked for uh, primary settlement status in the past um, we haven't been granted that yet, but we should be acting and uh, conducting ourselves like we are. Um, but it may be that formally uh, in the provincial policy documents going forward, there will be no such thing as a primary settlement area. So just stay tuned to that. Thank you very much, Trevor. So um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, I recall uh, back in 2007, 16, 17, we had talked about this at length. Uh, here and we had made that request and uh, Jerry just indicated when he was the the warden and the county was in support of that and uh, we were also I thought fairly close to um, completing uh, a new official plan and uh, here we are today and it kind of got back and and uh, here we are today trying to get through this so it is of the utmost importance I think a to get this plan completed and back before council uh, so as that we can move forward as quickly as we possibly can and and in the interim until we hear such from the province that they're going to do away with that primary settlement area I think we still pursue that because uh, as we know there is funding uh, elements that are tied to being a primary settlement area versus not being so I'd like to see us uh, continue to push that rope up the hill until such time that uh, we are told different uh, any other questions or comments from council all right, thanks very much, Matt. Very informative, appreciate it. And uh, 
We're now Thank at 10-2, uh, so I think we're going to carry on with the, Madam Clerk, did you want something to say? Sorry, Your Worship, there is just a motion uh, to receive. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we do have the uh, motion before us that the presentation and reported and report titled New Official Plan Update to the Council Meeting of April 11th, 2024 be received for information. Can I have a mover and a seconder on this, please? Moved by Councillor uh, Belanger, seconded by Councillor Timms. All in favor? That carries unanimously. Moving on to the next presentation, 7.2 on the agenda is the Wasaga Sports and Entertainment Division WSE 2024-04-411-12. And I believe this is uh, you, Mr. Deputy CAO. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, uh, pleased to uh, once again to Council. Uh, we may recall back in uh, February when we presented the grand opening uh, results of that week, uh, Council direction was to uh, report back with the business case for uh, sports and entertainment uh, uh, division and undertaking. So that's what we're presenting here today. And uh, the Wasaga that you see on sports and entertainment, if you're wondering why that doesn't say Wasaga Beach, uh, our tourism logo is Wasaga, so uh, entertainment uh, kind of aligns itself with our tourism efforts, so that's why that uh, that is in place. Um, you know, it's not the official logo, so Council can, can, can determine, you know, what that looks like uh, uh, moving forward uh, if, uh, you know, if in fact they want to look a little bit different uh, look and feel to it. I mean, why should we consider this? Well, it lines up with a lot of things that we're uh, undertaking at the moment. So we're pursuing a hotel. We're trying to drive the economic development across our municipality. We're trying to create a four-season destination as a municipality as well. Certainly, it supports many, many council priorities. Uh, you know, one of the goals we want to re-engage back is Central Ontario's uh, music capital. We were there once with the uh, Dardanella. We can be there again. And of course, uh, surplus revenues generated from these undertakings can uh, uh, be uh, directly applied back at Council's direction to, to the debt associated with the uh, uh, new uh, Twin Pad Arena and Library. So it's interesting to, uh, to undertake, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Central Ontario's music capital, but if you look at Austin, Texas, it's kind of a nice case study. So back in 1991, uh, the uh, City Council of the day set the vision for, uh, for that municipality to become the world's live music capital. Uh, staff execution of that vision and direction ever since has actually seen Austin, in fact, become the live, live music capital of the world. They generate some $1.8 billion in live music industry undertakings on an annual basis. And uh, they have uh, local uh, musicians to A-list celebrities come into town. And over the course of time, they, they mixed it up with the focus on dining. You know, everybody likes uh, like food. That's another uh, uh, great economic driver. So they go from fine food to your food trucks uh, on, the, on the streets. And in fact, uh, most of their restaurants and undertakings have some kind of music happening inside their doors as well. So the private sector is fully engaged. So it was an interesting undertaking by Austin, Texas. And it proved to be very, very successful and certainly uh, something that they've leveraged uh, from 1991 and still exists today. So are we breaking new ground? In, in a word, no, we're not. Uh, uh, what's in front of council today really replicates the St. John's uh, Municipal Services uh, Corporation. Uh, uh, they've started some time ago and very successfully uh, driving uh, entertainment into that area of, uh, and city. Uh, but also through our, our interactions and uh, chatting with other folks involved in the, these type of events, Mississauga, Edmonton, and Red Deer all have uh, varying degrees of uh, municipal service corporations and really common to us, they're all looking at driving tourism and driving the economy. And that's why they exist and that's why the uh, municipalities have, uh, have pursued, pursued, the, pursued those. And in terms of uh, hitting council priorities, we actually hit five priorities. Uh, one at council priority number eight, pursue uh, large tourism events. Uh, so uh, number 28 is pursue uh, community events. And number 48, pursue direct investment in tourism economy. Uh, 52 was resurrect tourism destination marketing plan and uh, number 58 was develop 10 market ready experiences so this uh, blends across all five of those uh, council priorities nicely and certainly it lines up with our tourism destination uh, marketing plan it says master plan there's my apologies a typo on my part uh, but really that uh, uh, you know plan is to see us become a four season destination and really focus on family friendly entertainment that's really what we want to be known for we want to drive to and aspire to so again this undertaking aligns itself quite nicely with the uh, tourism destination plan in place and uh, the council will be seen shortly i think from uh, from caitlin 
and it lines up with our pursuit of a hotel. We know from uh, the grand opening week, 50% uh, of the people that came to the grand opening events, uh, whether it was figure skating, uh, the alumni game, the concerts, were from out of town. And so they would have stayed at a hotel had we had one. Uh, but I can tell you for, with certainty, the band members, the NHL alumni players themselves, uh, Elvis Stoiko and the production teams all stayed in out-of-town hotels. So there's a huge hotel uh, uh, presence uh, because of that uh, grand opening week that was felt that presence and benefit was felt beyond our borders. But again, for a hotel, it's something that we can point to and say, here's what happened, here's what uh, occurred from this uh, one-week event, and give them a good sense of why they should open their doors here in Wasaga Beach. And really, this is rooted in our history. Uh, from 1918 to 2003, the Dard was one of the Central Ontario's major music destinations. However, somewhere along the way, you know, kind of let that slide and go to the, go to the wayside. But unlike the Kita Bala, who's continued on, they began in 1930 and still to this day are a music destination. So, you know, it has some uh, tenure. You can make this happen, you can stay with it, and, uh, you know, I think we have a chance to, to resurrect that. And uh, my argument to saying we can do that is look at the people who were here from 1986 to 2003. I mean, look at these bands. We just had Burton Cummings and Blue Rodeo in town. You know, you had Kim Mitchell, we've had April Wine. Uh, you look at the other uh, uh, acts that have been to town. Amanda Marshall's re resurrecting her career right now. Nelly Furtado is. You know, Glass Tiger. These are all well-known groups that uh, uh, played here uh, in the past, and I would argue would play here again. And uh, our residents and those coming to these concerts uh, can re-experience uh, some of the heydays of our music background and our music history. So, uh, quite an impressive list that I think can be replicated moving forward. What we did find from the um, uh, you know grand opening events is these major events exceed our current staff complements capabilities and bandwidth. I don't mean capabilities in terms of they can't do it. I mean in terms of time and the workload and the effort to undertake this uh, certainly uh, exceeded that uh, uh, that uh, that uh, current complement. And you know we really do plan need to plan nine months to twelve months ahead. And I'll point back to the key key to Ballad. Ballad just announced their entire year's concert venue. And so Josh Palish, who works for us, Josh wanted to grab one of the tickets, sold out. So Josh couldn't react quick enough to a demand in Key to Battle to get a ticket as early as uh, of March of this year. So quite impressive, but it does point to the fact that uh, you, know, you need a dedicated team with a dedicated focus to, to really make this happen. And really what we're proposing here is, uh, is four staff uh, be uh, hired to work for this uh, <coughs> new uh, sports and entertainment division, a director of entertainment, uh, contracts and agreement specialist, and two talent acquisition agents. And uh, you know the job descriptions for those, uh, because these sound uh, fairly mundane, but there's a lot of work involved in each one of these undertakings. So you know, our director really needs to look at uh, you know, developing uh, uh, you know, entertainment and sports programs that cater to diverse audiences and demographics, uh, create and manage budgets for the sports and entertainment initiatives, uh, collaborate with the commun communications director so we market pr appropriately, uh, foster relationships with sponsors, media partners, and other stakeholders, uh, stay updated on industry tens, market dynamics, and competitor activities to identify opportunities for innovation and growth, uh, pursue funding opportunities, I know we need to attract world-class entertainment, you know, create new festival opportunities, and develop an annual plan and business case that we can uh, present to council on a multi-year strategy. And at the end of the day, make sure we're measuring all along the way key performance indicators to present back to council, say, here's what's happening, here's what we've attempted to do, here's what it looks like today, here's where we're going to go tomorrow. Uh, so quite an undertaking. And the, uh, you know, the uh, talent acquisition agents, really, it seems as simple as I go to phone up and, you know, get Burton Cummings to come to town, but that's, that's just when the work begins. Uh, once you get there, there's complex riders and they have deliverables in those, uh, uh, you know, that we have to deliver to. So you have to track all those elements of those riders and make them uh, come into play. Really, uh, you know, the day of uh, the concerts, uh, really, it's a major D services for the act. So we had to get, uh, you know, Jim Cuddy and his band in and out of the arena. We had to feed them. We had to, you know, walk them through the t -pal. Those type of things happened as well. Uh, but beyond that, though, um, you know, recruit, train, and supervise staff members involved in the, in the operations, including event coordinators and support personnel, assist with marketing uh, and promotions, assist with identification of talent and event opportunities, you know, research successful uh, events from other venues, identify best practices, 
you know, and the, a lot of work goes involved in actually uh, venue su uh, support of, uh, you know, the volunteers, all the food and beverage activities that go on there, rental of equipment, arranged talent, uh, travel for the talent, uh, arranged facilities for the talent, uh, follow the rider requirements. Uh, there's a back and forth and it's a heavy lift. So there's a, they might look like ducks in a pond, but I'm telling you, those feet are moving under the water and they're moving quickly. And then the one here that um, really we need to say, uh, contracts and agreements analyst. I can tell you, and uh, Jocelyn uh, can appreciate this as well, these contracts are, are complex and our ability to invoice them properly, receive our money, get money, have properly signed agreements. Somebody has to manage all that so that when it hits finance, it's there, it's ready to go, it's ready to launch through. And I can tell you that uh, you know, going through uh, uh, what we did in the, in the last couple of weeks, you know, a couple of months, you know that agreement specialist. There's a lot of eyes to dot, a lot of T's to cross, and a lot of, a lot of making sure that hey, did you get this done? Did, did uh, you know, did Sandra get that? Um uh, you know, advertising campaign approved by the band, approved by the talent agency. So there's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of eyes to dot. So that's a critical uh, critical component. And what we did for the annual wage and uh, budget, do you see the number there, 447,000? What we did was we identified uh, in advance kind of where these four jobs uh, would fit in our current uh, salary band. And we took the mid-range of that uh, band, and then, of course, we applied the benefit uh, ratio on top of that. So that's where that number uh, came from. So it's fairly well uh, researched. Uh, but what we did see was an opportunity to, um, sorry, just flipping pages here. Um, that the, an opportunity to have the uh, director of entertainment actually uh, uh, look after our current community events structure as well. So they report up into that same structure. And, uh, you know, the purpose of this move would really to ensure a consistent approach to tourism, a uh, consistent approach to sponsorships, uh, our strategic goals, and also work to leverage the contracts and agreements specialist. And by that, I mean we'd have eyes on all our events, whether they low charge, no charge events, or the demand generating events. But our contracts agreement specialists can handle all the contracts and agreements coming from the community event size and put that same discipline in place. So again, when it hits treasury, treasury, it's there, it's ready to execute, and everybody can get on, on with their life. Because I can tell you if, you, if you don't do that, there's far too much back and forth that uh, uh, time is wasted. So, so that contracts agreement specialist not only can support uh, the new division that can also uh, support the uh, current existing structure as well. And the revenue streams here are multiple. So, of course, sports tourism is a revenue stream. I can look at conferences and trade shows. I look at uh, maybe the small urban uh, municipalities conference could go uh, into our area. Uh, you know, trade show of any nation go under our area. Festivals, uh, I mean, we can do four season festivals for sure. What are they? What do they look like? We need to determine, but they can certainly. Uh, Certainly do that. High school graduations, uh, college graduations, any kind of graduation ceremonies can, uh, can undertake there. And our sponsorship, we really want to look at sponsorship in terms of uh, uh, selling that sponsorship package for everything we're doing for the entire 20, year of 2025. So it won't be one-off pursuit of can you fund this, can you fund this, can you fund this. Here's everything we're doing in 2025. Here's the sponsorship opportunities. Uh, so, you know, can uh, pursue some major sponsors uh, beyond our local borders as well. So you can get to the you know, major corporations and attract them uh, to come to town and see how we go. And of course, the concerts themselves uh, generate uh, positive revenue as well. And so what we did here, what's important on this slide really is see from the concerts, we uh, winced and repeated what we just experienced with Burton coming in Blue Rodeo. Uh, so we know what our ticket sales could look like and the ticket sales there is, uh, this model in front of council is back-to-back uh, -back concerts just like we did at the grand opening week. So this would be a Friday and a Saturday. The ticket sales are really, uh, you know, 4,400 tickets uh, at $100 each on average. So we know we have to get that average price point down. So that uh, reflected that. Uh, we know what we can get for in terms of sponsorship. Uh, we know what we can get in terms of revenue share. And something that we didn't uh, do at the grand opening week, but uh, we can take advantage of is actually on-site parking at the uh, TPAL as well. So, you know, the ability to generate revenues is, is, is clear to us in how we get there. 
Uh, the expenses, uh, we know the expenses uh, from, uh, from the grand opening as well. So those expenses you see in front of us uh, include the cost of, uh, you know, recreation have to, uh, you know, put the new floor in, uh, take the old glass out, put new glass in. That encompasses all those uh, undertaking, our policing costs, our uh, security costs, our transportation costs. So, you know, it covers everything that, uh, that should, be, uh, should be in place. And the big expenses really are the, the band themselves and the production costs. Those are the two, two big ticket items. So we're aware of those quite uh, quite as well. Um, uh, going down the line, the uh, corporate cost that you see there really is that uh, that 447,000 that I showed in that previous slide. Uh, we just weighted that against each weekend, so that's just an equal distribution of that workload assigned to each each concert. Uh, the sponsor acquisition, uh, we spoke to some firms, so we got some sense of what it would cost us to get somebody to get those major sponsors in play, and you know, so what their baseline costs would be and what those percentages are, so we kind of understand what it would cost us for the sponsorship. And then uh, for the TPAL rental, really we know that we're about $2,000 a day when we take that ice down, so when Chris is not able to sell ice at that rink, uh, generally we're taking away a $2,000 per day opportunity, uh, so that includes uh, replacing that lost opportunity, and we also know that uh, Chris and team experience uh, an extra workload during that period of time for cleaning and uh, you know the extra things that are happening there, so uh, that represents the, the cost going back towards uh, uh, towards that, and you can see that uh, you know through this program we generate uh, about $60,000 in revenue for uh, uh, for uh, for the TPAL, so we know our total expenses, and we uh, can predict our, our surplus. And, and for council here, although this is a rinse and repeat four times over, you know not all the bands are going to cost us 100,000 or 150,000 to get you know bands in production in here. So if we get a lower band, uh, will our expenses will adjust accordingly? But our targeted goal is for all four weekends in 2025 is to generate uh, a surplus of about $75,000 per weekend. So everything we do, the lens is getting that surplus at that $75,000 mark, that's the target that we want to hit. And in front of council here as well is, uh, you know, our break even on this is 85% break even. So 85% of revenue targets, targets or ticket sales will, uh, will accomplish our goals. Uh, festivals, this is based on um, uh, an October fest, uh, festivals that we've seen around, but it's a, really a fall festival. But what you see in front of us is a kind of a proven concept in other municipalities. And basically what they plan on is 4,000 people on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at about a $30 ticket price point. Uh, so you see that coming through. Again, we sell sponsorship against that. A revenue share of, uh, you know, if it's an October fest, a revenue share of the beer sales. You know, we charge you to be there and put your booth in there. That's uh, that's a value as well. So we plan to sell uh, booths and, again, the parking revenue. So we know our revenue. And, again, we know our, our expenses, again, uh, against that revenue. Uh, the corporate cost, again, is the weighted average of those salaries uh, for that uh, staff uh, at, uh, you know, per this, this event. Uh, in this case, we're saying that uh, we'll offset the TPAL by, TPAL by about $6,000. And sponsorship acquisition, we know that price point. So again, uh, the surplus here is about $62,000. And again, uh, whatever we do on these uh, other festivals, we'll have that $60,000 target in their head for surplus. And that's really uh, the, the bottom line target for the division. Uh, Third-party relationships. Now, right now, this is just a, a placeholder, but a revenue share of about $25,000. And uh, so right now we're talking to uh, a couple of folks who want to uh, put on major events here in town, whether it's on the beach or, or at the T-PAL. And, you know, I've, uh, you know, we've got to come up with a, uh, a price point to bring back to council. So you've got a rate card for this. But the rate card in our mind would be about $25,000 for, for what we're looking at, whether you're going to do a third-party concert at the, uh, the T-PAL or you're going to do something on the beach. So uh, we plan to... Uh, land one of those I can tell you right now that you know as early as uh, Tuesday of this week we've been approached again with an opportunity so again I see this third party uh, revenue stream is something that's uh, real and tangible and we get our hands on so 25,000 uh, 2025 at a glance Again, uh, if you look to the far right, you can see the revenue streams of about 2.2 million against the expenses of about 1.8, and so there's surplus in and around that 400,000. So that's just really this slide is just taking all those other slides, and I've rolled it all up to uh, one big, uh, big number uh, in front of council. And I probably I said no municipal tax implications, but that's probably. Uh, 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 poorly stated, there is a positive impact to, to tax implication. We're going to be able to take the surplus and pay down debt, which is a positive impact on our uh, municipal finances. 
The economic impact, this again, is from the Tourism uh, Department of uh, the Province of Ontario. And so when you punch in our numbers and drivers, you can see that at the end of the year, these concerts will have an economic impact of about $1.6 million uh, uh, across, uh, across the year. And, uh, you know, that $1.6 million is people filling up their gas tanks, stopping for lunch, having dinner, going shopping, uh, whatever the case may be. But they're coming to town and their wallets are opening. And I do know from uh, uh, talking to Councillor White, who's not here today, but uh, Councillor White told me that uh, he and his wife wanted to go to, uh, to dinner at the far end of town, the west end of town. You couldn't be farther away from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, from the arena and couldn't get a spot in the restaurant. So that's the type of impact we know we have at our... Uh, on our, on, our, our, on our businesses. And again, for our businesses, they're entrepreneurs. So you start driving this time of traffic, they're going to find a way to generate revenue for themselves. They'll find a way to engage, be participative, you know, and, and fire up their engines. I've seen it before, and I can tell you that, uh, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, uh, this is going to be a big lift to our community. Uh, the revenue uh, projections, so what we're seeing here in the slide is this uh, the orange uh, numbers are our you know, surplus in 2025, 2026, and 2027. So you can see that uh, based on our predictions that I presented here today to Council. Uh, but in fairness to Council, we also wanted to know if you wanted to do a, a kind of a tried and true model. That's the, uh, the blue bars in front of you. And so what we did is we looked at the City of Barrie, City of Peterborough, and City of Kingston, and we averaged out their rate cards. Uh, so if they were to rent their arena to do a concert or do what we're doing, you can see they'll make about $100,000 a year to 125 to, you know, 150 ish maybe on the, in 2027. Um, so, you know, there is revenue uh, to, be, to be had uh, if you went tried and true, but you can see that uh, surplus pales in comparison to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the orange bars. And I guess the other thing I'd add on that, of course, of course, when you look at the city of Peterborough, uh, Peterborough and Kingston, you know, can we demand that same rates as they do? Probably not, because they've got uh, venues that are to seat 10,000 people to our 2,200. So the, the revenue stream for them, I think, is, uh, is greater than the revenue stream that we could realize on our own. But nonetheless, it gives council a sense of, you know, what could be out there. Um, what this tells us, though, is uh, you'll see in the uh, report, but not here in the uh, slide, was you know we were doing a nominal amount of uh, five thousand dollars to paying back the uh, uh, the five hundred thousand dollars in concedural revenue, which means you know we pay a minimal amount over over a period of time. Uh, we could adjust that upwards as council direction, but uh, at, we want to go minimal while we understand what the cash flow is, what this looks like, and how this looks and feels. At some point in time, if council wants to increase that number, you can. Um, but the you know the ultimate goal here was to uh, you know, really, if you look at the end of 2026, council sitting on about you know just under a uh, million dollars in surplus. So at that point in time, council could say, you know what, we'll pay off that uh, that casino debt. We could pay, actually pay the casino and leave the uh, corporation with about five hundred thousand dollars to to spend and move on. Uh, the bigger opportunity, the greater opportunity, perhaps, is in 2027. You know, at that point in time, you're about 1.3 million dollars in surplus. If you paid off the balance of the casino, I'm going to call it casino debt in air quotes, but if you paid back the casino, replenished the casino funds, you know, council sitting there with about $800,000 to run this forward. Of that $800,000, council of the day will be able to say, I want to put that all in the TPAL. So you're going to be in great spots uh, at the end of every year to make a determination on what to do with that surplus. Uh, so that's uh, kind of why the uh, uh, the smaller amount was there, but the municipal benefit is, uh, you know, um, you know, by the end of 2026, even with that $5,000 per event, we'll have paid down $100,000 of the of the 500,000. So, you know, at the end of that 2026, you know, the you know the top up to the casino revenues would be about $400,000 if council determines to do that. Um, you know, I guess Jocelyn correct me here, but you know, I look at the uh, uh, casino as uh, as a kind of an interest-free loan, if you will. The TPAL has interest on it, so you know, the council might want to weigh that. In fact, that you know, do I want to pay something down that has interest on it uh, more rapidly than pay something down that's interest-free? But each, you know, each year this will report will come to council, and you'll be able to make that uh, determination. I guess the recommendation is in front of us. I guess the only thing I didn't speak to was uh, uh, the model here, and you heard me say Municipal Service Corporation a couple of times, so the model here, and it's in the report but not in my presentation, 
was that they would structure a municipal services corporation uh, and uh, whose uh, the town of Wasaga Beach would be 100% shareholders and all sitting members of council would form the board of directors for that corporation. So council's never hands off on, on this model. Uh, Joss and I are speaking as well, and, and the you know, model would be if council approves this that uh, you know, we'll bill the uh, uh, sports and entertainment division on a monthly basis to recover the costs for, for seconded staff. Uh, so the model here again, I guess I should have backed up there a bit. So you know, sometimes I get talking instead of paying attention to my notes. Um, yeah, the model here. This uh, so the model here. These uh, these four positions are all seconded positions from uh, from the municipality. So current employees of the municipality would be seconded over to this division, uh, and so and it's a pilot program that I'm recommending goes to the end of December 2027. And the reason I'm saying December 2027, this is a good lengthy uh, pilot program, but truthfully, the 2027 budget will be set by the next term of council. The 2026 council will come in and they set that budget, so they'll be able to make an early determination on what 2027 looks like. And then the backfilling uh, for these positions, there's no extra cost to the municipality because uh, you know, if, if I got seconded over to this division, my salary is already in our budget. So the person coming in to backfill is already budgeted for and accounted for in terms of our budget and in terms of our uh, salaries and benefits as well. So your worship, the last slide is the, uh, the recommendation, but uh, so I'll, uh, I'll kind of pause there and let uh, uh, council ask questions, but I'll turn it back to you, your worship. Thank you very much, Jerry. Very informative. Great uh, presentation. We appreciate it. Members of Council, Councillor Timms. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my question was about this comment, and uh, I'm not sure I really fully understand what you're saying. So um, these positions will be filled by existing staff in a secondment situation, and will we be replacing those people um, with the, the, the salary that um, the seconded uh, employees are earning. I, I don't even know if my question is making sense, but are we going to hire to backfill those positions? Yes, yeah, so we'll hire to backfill those positions, most likely on a, on a contracted break, uh, agreement arrangement, so it'll be contracted positions, but uh, the salaries uh, and benefits associated with those positions already exist in the budget today and moving forward. So there's no extra cost to, in terms of uh, budget implications. If I could just jump in, uh, the one, one comment that I think you might have missed, the, the design of this group is to be self-sustaining, so no impact on the tax base. Very similar if you think about how our building department works. Uh, our building department staff are not funded by taxpayers. They're paid for by uh, fees. So the model that uh, the deputy CEO has proposed, there's one-time seed funding to get this up and running, but the revenue that will be generated will pay salary so that there's no additional uh, impact of the tax base. And then the existing uh, um, um, Sorry, lost my train of thought. Existing salaries would be covered as, as per usual, but there's no net increase to taxpayers. Uh, one second, uh, Councillor. I'm just looking at some clarification from the clerk. This was pulled, this item. Uh, but these, this, these questions are with respect to the presentation, not the motion. So my question is, should I be asking the individuals who pulled it to speak first to the presentation as well, or only to uh, when we uh, go to vote on the uh, recommendation. Thank you, Your Worship. The report was moved up by staff to accompany the presentation for efficiency um, so that the discussion was all at one time throughout the meeting. Um, there is no rule um, that the person that pulls, written rule that the person that pulls or asks that the report be pulled um, goes first. So as long as everybody is provided the opportunity to speak to a report or a presentation, we're well within the rules. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Normally, however, I would ask the folks who pulled the report uh, to speak to it first. Um, but in the case of a presentation, uh, I'm looking at this very differently. The presentation has been made, there's going to be questions. Uh, when we get to the recommendation that is pulled, then I would go to those individuals first. Does that seem reasonable? That is reasonable, All yes. right, thank you. All right, go ahead, carry on, Councillor Timms. Thank you for clarifying that, Your Worship, because in fact I did pull it, and then I went back to the clerk and said, I don't need to pull this because it's a presentation, correct? So um, thank, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I, 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 
just comments now. Um, with regard to the tourist destination management plan, uh, I think the public would like to um, be aware that uh, uh, one of the top priorities of that plan is, is our residents first. And, um, and that's exciting when that uh, comes to council for everybody to see. I've always been, um, uh, since I worked here even at the town in 1819, I really felt that we undersold our third party relationship opportunities. So I'm glad that's being looked at closely and, and reviewed. And um, uh, the community events department is part of the the uh, um, service corporation. So will the revenue also support those employment uh, folks? Yes, so thank you. That's a great, uh, through your worship to Councillor Tim, a great question. So the community events will stay strictly under the town of Wasaga Beach direction. Uh, but because the director uh, of the overall corporation is a town employee, that director will manage that group and manage the uh, outsource group. Thank you, Councillor Timms. All right, next is, uh, did you have a question, Councillor, or did you want to wait, Councillor Doyle? Well, uh, it's entirely up to you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Thank you, Jerry, for your presentation. I just failed to understand why we as a town would want to become concert and event promoters while we have so many other issues that are priority. Also, to that point. Points two, three, four, and five, I believe should be voted on separately as they are a request for authorization. Contrary to point one, which is merely a confirmation of a received report. At this point in time, I cannot support this motion as I feel we are spending our money and energy into the wrong area of needed services for our residents. In the future, it would be ideal, but today I feel it is not. And as per your presentation, I agree with you. Austin, Texas is an amazing large music capital city, whereas Osaga Beach, it's a small community town. But don't get me wrong, I'm all for concerts and entertainment, but I don't believe it should have its own separate corporation. I like the way it is now for the time being, moving forward. So at this time, I, I cannot support this motion. Thank you. Any comments from staff? I don't think so, Your Worship. Uh, the Councillor is stating her position on that, and uh, I'd be remiss to uh, weigh in. Through you, the Mayor, there's uh, there's a few things that at one point I'd uh, uh, probably like a little bit of clarification uh, just on, uh, I, I guess, the fact that uh, we have a, a major investment uh, to pay down. Uh, we also... I believe have the state of the art facility in the greater surrounding area. And uh, certainly that puts us in a position to take advantage of that. Uh, and uh, so, so I do support and uh, I think the clarity I need is that uh, with the casino money that's provided the town every year, it's not that we can just spend that on anything as my understanding is it it can't go to reduce taxation. These are one of, this is one of the things that we could use the money and make an investment. And um, I think your, uh, your presentation uh, is, shows a very good return on that investment. But the other thing that we didn't talk about so far, we talked a little bit about the economic impact of all these people coming to town and uh, grabbing a tank of gas or a, or a dinner or that, but I, I think more importantly is the message that we sell out, uh, send out to the greater development community. We are a town that is missing a lot of products and services uh, for our residents. We, we drive our residents out of town every day to shop. And I, th I think if we put together a cohesive plan that we can drive this kind of additional volume year round, it's gonna wake up a lot of people to reconsider Wasega Beach as a place to do business. And I keep going back to our original master plan when we talked about the kind of revenue that is driven 
buy a proper downtown. We have nothing today. We probably get 2% revenue on 2% or 3% of the land mass when the real opportunity is to build that over time to 20% or, or greater. And I think these initiatives are the kind of things that are forethinking and progressive and uh, not even out of the box, really, because uh, as I said, you've studied a number of municipalities that do the same thing. And, and they don't do it at a loss. They, uh, ultimately, this can be a tremendous advantage to the Wasega Beach taxpayer. It's not a negative. And, and we're not presenting or intending it to be a negative. If, it's, if it becomes a burden to our taxpayer, then we have failed. And uh, I think this council is getting a pretty good track record of not failing. So uh, I have my support. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions or comments? Sorry, Mr. CAO or Deputy CAO. Yeah, thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, uh, Councillor Boulanger reminded me that I should read the notes on my slides. So, in terms of return on investment, uh, by the end of 2027, it's 167% return on that $500,000 uh, coming into the gate. And so, an annual return of 38.79%. So, uh, thank you for your uh, apologies for not sharing that to Council. I didn't reflect my notes, but when you raised that point, I knew I had those numbers in front of me. Thank you, Jerry. Councillor Ego. Thank you, <clears throat> through you, Your Worship. Thank you very much for that presentation. And I'll be succinct here. I think it's high time that we did have such a structure in place. We're getting everything else in place, and it's high time that we were able to draw on what proved to be so successful um, at the TPAL. And I absolutely support that we move forward with this type of uh, entertainment plan. Thank you, Councillor Ego. Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I'm uh, really excited to see this come forward. Um, events can, can you can, a uh, town can either live or die by their events, right? They can be very um, expensive, sometimes unsuccessful. You don't get the turnout you want. Um, so getting a more cohesive strategy, I think, is, is smart investment for the taxpayer. When you speak about other communities, you look at Bala, Makita Bala. A friend of mine has a cottage there. I spend a lot of time up there in the summertime sometimes. And it is the economic driver for that community. When there's a concert in town, every restaurant's busy. The streets are busy. Everything's um, full. And they don't even have a hotel. So um, I, I completely agree in terms of the financial potential impact. Um, Super happy to hear about the cohesiveness in regards to the corporate sponsorships. I agree with Councillor Timms that sometimes we've undersold those assets, and, and so I, I really support um, you know, corporate opportunities for other folks to financially contribute to this, uh, this lift. And the, the only question I had was, um, should we be successful with the high school, because that incorporated um, a community theater, would that space be programmed by this division because I also see a lot of theater and arts opportunities for drivers as well. Uh, this is for sure, my mind drifted there, uh, Deputy Mayor. So uh, my mind was there, and as a matter of fact, I uh, took a moment to look at uh, you know uh, some of the other theaters in and around us, and how close they were to us, and and uh, what the opportunity is. So we got to you know Drayton Theaters, uh, you know Penetang Machine, and uh, you know over in uh, St. Jacob. So I have uh, I have that thoughts crossed my mind as well, um, and you know you could program it that way, and uh, you know if you look at the uh, the theater in Brampton right now, they're using the theater in Brampton to uh, generate they call it um, reverse I think RFP so actually uh, uh, businesses and uh, people looking to do business with the city of Brampton go and they actually get introduced to people who tell them what business is coming down the pipe and how they best engage with the city of Brampton so uh, high school theater can be certainly leveraged by this group and certainly leveraged by our community go ahead Deputy Mayor Snell thank you your worship uh, just one other point I wanted to mention as well is is highlighting your point about third party you know, we have such a unique venue here. Where in Canada can you find this length of beach that looks like we're in Florida? Like when you think back to April Wine and just what that looked like, the vibe, what that felt like. We have such a unique venue. Um, and then also too with the Twin Pad Arena and Library. So having a team specifically looking to solicit third party where it's just a win-win financially for us is, is uh, much needed as well. So I do support this motion. 
Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Snell. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Belanger? You, through you, the Mayor. The, the only other comment I'd uh, like to make is that uh, uh, I had uh, been involved in the Wasaga Beach Blues Festival for quite a, a while. I, uh, I co-chaired that one year with Kathy Mulgrew, who uh, continues to be the chair of, of that group uh, every year. And that is probably a, a team of about 12 or 13 people that work the best part of a year on one event. And I, and I think the I think the general public uh, maybe thinks that uh, that these things just just happen. Like I mean, the the Blues Festival is a hundred eighty seven thousand dollar budget, uh, totally managed by uh, volunteers. And like if they have a shortfall, it's it's a it's a big trouble. And yet these people uh, devote their time to help make Wasega Beach a better place. Uh, but uh, Kathy would uh, probably probably like to retire from that after 11 years, but uh, th there's no replacement. So uh, without a team in place to make this happen, it doesn't happen. And, uh, and you don't generate the revenue and all the other economic benefit that we discuss. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions or comments from members of Council? All right, seeing none, I, I uh, again, thank you, uh, Jerry, for the report. I think this is a, an excellent idea. And, and I just, uh, you know, I look at this and say we, we have some options here. And what are the options when it comes to our community? Do we want a community that attracts car rallies? That costs us millions of dollars over the last uh, four, five, six years and creates total havoc in our community? Do we want uh, a community that attracts... Uh, a lot of um, people who come here simply to, to drink and party and for no other reason, um, or that come and maybe spend the day but spend no money. Although day trippers are a big part of our economy and we appreciate it, what we do know is that it's simply not enough. And so, or, or do we want an entertainment capital and a place that has food and, and entertainment that we offer on a regular basis that many people, are going to want to come and visit and enjoy. If I have to choose one, I choose the latter. And, and when is the right time? I, I often hear this, uh, you know, the time isn't right. And when I look at our community and I look at where we've been uh, and where we're going, um, when was the right time to make these types of changes and to move our community forward to a positive, sustainable community? It was in 2007 or sooner. So we're late. We're a little late to the game. Um, but better late than never, I say. And we have an opportunity here where we do have some funding that we can use as seed funding. Uh, and we're looking at an opportunity here that is going to not cost taxpayers a single penny, but it's going to make them on average $400,000 a year to help pay down a huge debt or reduce taxes. Who knows what current council will say in future or what future councils will do should they decide to keep it. But I would suspect that by 2027, if this is moving along as well as we expect it will, future councils will keep it. I kind of look at this similar to I look at Wasaga distribution. The profit being made here is like a dividend to the community uh, and it pays every year. Um, you know, we, we can stand still and we can repeat the same things that we've been doing for years that we know haven't worked. And um, we know where that's going to leave us. Or we can be innovative. We can do our homework, which staff has done here. We know what the two biggest tourist drivers are or economic drivers are from a tourist standpoint, and that is sports, entertainment, and food. Top three. Well, we've got two of them covered here. Uh, we've got the longest freshwater beach in the world in the summer, and I would argue in the winter as well, spring and fall. We do have to move this community past the summertime destination to three to four months of the year. We are working very hard and diligently on bringing a hotel or two to this community. 
to redeveloping our beachfront. So it's high time. It's high time that we put out the bells and whistles and we find a way to not only generate revenue outside of tax dollars for the taxpayer, but that we find a much better way than we've used in the past to drive the economics of this town. Economic development is paramount for the survival of our local businesses. I'd argue that it's paramount for the survival of any community period. Councillor Belanger mentioned that we drive our citizens out of town to different services to shop. I've said it for many years, we don't leave town to buy shoes or a dress or a shirt because we want to. We do it because we don't have choice or very little choice here. Um, to be a complete community, we need to offer these services. We need to offer shoe stores and dress shops and boutiques and and uh, restaurants and cafes and a vibrant Main Street and a vibrant tourist community that ensures that our businesses that we require, we want, we need, I've heard it from thousands and thousands of our residents over the years, that we want and need an economic uh, atmosphere that is conducive to staying here in town. We want to be able to go down to the downtown core and visit and see and shake hands with our friends and neighbors and to meet for dinner and to buy a pair of shoes or go to a flower shop. Um, we desire that, like everyone else does in every other community. I don't know anyone unless they're moving to Tuck -de Yuck Tuck, and I mean no disrespect to Tuck -de Yuck Tuck, uh, that moves to a community because they want to have to hop in their car when we're trying to be uh, environmentally friendly and drive 16 or more kilometers in order to sometimes just buy a type of produce that you might want. I mean, just think about this. So I love the fact that you've looked outside the box to find a, a better solution. We know that we can't do this uh, with staff alone. This comes at a zero cost to the taxpayer. Uh, and uh, shows us it will generate revenue. We've learned from doing our first two back-to-back -back concerts and other events at the TPAL that it can be done. Um, and it can be done quite easily now that we've learned so, so much from what we went through in that week-long um, celebration and the grand opening. And uh, so, you know, I, I just think it's important to note that we can stand back on our heels and we can wait till tomorrow till the cows come home. Um, but tomorrow may never come. It's our destiny. It's our responsibility as a council to move our community forward in a positive, realistic, affordable, and sustainable fashion. So is that our residents have a better place and it's tough to get a better place than Wasaga Beach. But it is possible to get a better place to live, work, learn, and play. And so thank you for the report. Uh, I support it wholeheartedly, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to voting on this. Having said that, uh, Madam Clerk, this was pulled, so normally we would wait until consideration of other matters. But I think we've had a fulsome uh, conversation and debate here. Uh, so should I just vote on this, have you do that vote now, or should we still wait then uh, until um, uh, matters for uh, consideration? Thank you, Your Worship. So the matter has been, the report has been brought up to the presentation section, um, and it has been indicated that it's been pulled. I think that it um, makes sense right now to vote on the matter, um, and if any councillor would request a recorded vote, um, we can do that. So I'm just going to look to uh, Councillor DeLeo, uh, who pulled this. Are you okay to vote now on it, uh, Councillor DeLeo? Absolutely. And I think you want a recorded vote, correct? Yes, please. On all items? All right, thank you. Uh, question, Councillor Belanger? Yes, uh, well, Councillor DeLeo asked to, to split the vote on, on a number of items, so I don't know how we move forward on that. No, no, I just said they should have been, oh. but I'm not asking that. Yeah. But we can but still good. split the vote on each item. That's not an issue. No, we can have it as a whole. As a whole? No okay, problem. as long as you're good with that. All right, so then uh, 
I will read uh, the recommendation and then ask uh, the clerk to call the vote. So recommended motion is that the report titled Wasaga Sports and Entertainment Division WSE to the council meeting of April 11th, 2024 be received and that council direct staff to establish the new Wasaga Sports and Entertainment Division as a pilot program expiring on December 31st, 2027 to be revisited by the next term of council. And three, that council direct staff to establish a municipal services corporation to promote economic development and set up, sorry, the setup and legal costs for which are to be drawn from general reserves. That council approve a one-time funding allocation of $500,000 of casino revenue to the WSE division to be repaid out of surplus at a rate of 5,000 per major WSE event. And item number five, that council authorize the deputy CAO to execute the contracts and plans for two November 2024 concerts at the Wasaga Stars Arena. I read the question, can I have a mover and a seconder on this please? Councillor Ego, Deputy Mayor Snell, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. On the recorded vote, Councillor Belanger. In favor. Councillor DeLeo. Oppose. Councillor Ego. In favor. Deputy Mayor Snell. In favor. Councillor Timms. In favor. Mayor Smith. In favor. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Moving on to item number eight, delegations. We have none at this time. And item number nine is government relations, and we have none at this time either. And at this point in the meeting, we are going to break uh, for lunch. We'll take 30 minutes and we will return at 10 after 2.
uh, through your worship, we're live. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Clerk, and uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, sorry we're a little late coming back. We just had a couple of issues we were dealing with, but uh, we're now into the agenda and on to item number 10, which is staff reports, and the following reports uh, report items have been pulled and moved to matters for consideration, items 10.3 and 10.6. And I do understand, uh, Deputy Mayor Snell, that you had uh, wanted to make some comments uh, here on these reports. So I thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just wanted to, I'm not sure actually if it would be in this section or not, just to make comment um, in regards to the first aid training that was provided um, by Captain Babalar. It was an outstanding, it was great service. Um, lots of great learning and very appropriate timing because um, just on Tuesday at County Council, the paramedic services came forward with a report uh, in regards to all the AED equipment and um, whatnot. And I was very impressed at just how easy it is and how, how much it walks you through the process if you need to use that equipment. So I just encourage um, other council when the opportunity comes up, take advantage. It's great training, time well spent. And um, thank you very much for, for doing that and coordinating that, Chief. All right, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Snell. Uh, sorry, Deputy Snell. Madam Deputy Mayor Snell. Uh, so the following uh, report items were pulled 10 3 and 10 6. And uh, we do have a motion then that the following consent list items under staff reports and all recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding agenda items uh, pulled from the motion and moved to matters for consideration <laughs> to be voted on separately. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Moved by Councillor Deleo, seconded by Councillor Timms. All in favor? That motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> Moving on to item number 11, correspondence items. The following correspondence items have been pulled and moved to matters for consideration to be voted on separately. Items 11.1.1, .1. and the motion reads that uh, the consent list items under correspondence be received for information except for correspondence moved to matters for consideration to be voted on separately. A mover and a seconder on this, please. Councillor Timms and Councillor Eagle, all in favor? That carries unanimously. Item number 12 is uh, minutes of boards and committees. Uh, that the consent list items under minutes and boards and committees be received for information. Any comments or questions on this? Seeing none, a mover and a seconder, please. Deputy Mayor Snell and Councillor DeLeo, all in favor? That motion also carries unanimously. And now on to item number 13, matters for consideration. 10.3, uh, 2024 insurance pooling update. And I believe this was pulled by Councillor Belanger. Councillor? Thank you, through the mayor. Uh, I certainly understand that uh, pooling uh, will uh, reduce initially our premiums, uh, hopefully they would and they they're talking about building up a reserve uh, but you know I looked at some of uh, our muni our neighboring municipalities have gotten into situations uh, you know whether it be re-infrastructure or whatever where uh, costs are building up they're not necessarily maintaining and updating at the same level as what our community does uh, there are certain infrastructures uh, like dams or other things that are in uh, municipalities that uh, aren't necessarily in ours. So my concern was if there's a catastrophic uh, event or a high liability event, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, a major water problem, like uh, I think there was in Wyerton many years ago or whatever would, uh, and, and then those costs hit the pool, then uh, I'm, I'm worried about you know, we're, we're acting and maybe more responsibly. Uh, we're avoiding uh, certain risks or mitigating risk that another municipality finds themselves involved in that uh, costs a great deal of money to an insurance company. And then those, that cost that is distributed to all of the municipalities, not just that municipality that necessarily was in error, or got hit by a tornado, or uh, whatever. And, and I'm not saying that I'm opposed to not sharing that, because we also run the risk of a catastrophic event. I was more concerned about the distribution, whether or not that municipality would have to burden more of a premium increase because of that event, as opposed to it just being evenly spread out 
against 16 municipalities. Anyone want to comment on this? Um, thank you, Council Belanche, and through you. So the discussion around mismanagement of assets um, and infrastructure was presented um, whenever they did our presentation in February by the company that did the feasibility study. So mismanagement, if the pool sees um, cost increased from specific municipalities over and over again, they will be held accountable for those. That's going to be set up in the clause, like in the agreement that all of the municipalities will sign for joining the pool. But in terms of like catastrophic or extreme events, it would be held like a traditional insurance company would handle those situations. We don't have any ability to um, really control those. So it would be, there would be potential that our fees could go up from a catastrophic event. Now, whatever they're looking at the rates and the premiums for each municipality, they are gonna take into consideration um, infrastructure and that type of stuff. But more information on this will come as the county does more information or more research on it. Thank you, Catherine. Any other questions or comments on this? I, uh, I just uh, would say I, I echo your concern, Councillor. Uh, one of my concerns is, of course, the two separated cities. Not so much Aurelia because it's about 30,000 people, 35,000 people, but Barrie is much larger and has a lot more infrastructure, a lot more people, and a lot more opportunity for problems. And uh, so uh, good to know that they'll be looking at uh, how they're going to um, uh, work the uh, ins and outs when it comes to the premiums paid by each municipality. So that's good. But I, I fully support this. I think it's a, a great idea. Our, uh, I'll look to our treasurer just for the uh, public's information. I think our in, uh, insurance last year, uh, sorry, this year increased by almost 30%. Uh, and we anticipate uh, large increases again for next year. Isn't that correct? Yes, through your worship, uh, the the increase was about about 25 percent, I believe, in the in this year. And we are not seeing any change in that trend. The insurance market still seems to be um, increasing steadily at very large increases. So uh, this certainly is a viable option to be considered and weighed in terms of what other opportunities do we have to curb these costs. Um, so thank you. I think it's important to note that many large corporations are looking to self-insure now as well because of the insurance costs are just uh, getting to be uh, completely out of hand. So, all right, uh, if there's no other questions or comments on this, I would ask, uh, sorry, I'd ask for a move and a seconder for the recommendation at the consent uh, Sorry, that the report titled 2024 Insurance Pooling Update to the Council Meeting of April 11th, 2024 be received for information. And uh, Madam Clerk, if you could call the recorded vote. Yes, we have a mover and a second. Mover and a second, yes. Councillor Timms and Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, Your Worship. Councillor Balanche. In favor. Councillor DeLeo. In favor. Councillor Ego. In favor. Deputy Mayor Snell. In favor. Councillor Timms. In favor. Mayor Smith. In favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now uh, item 10.6 is the Flamins, Fram and Sloker Beachfront Development Non-Disclosure Agreement 2024-0411-09, pulled by Councillor Timms and Councillor DeLeo. Councillor Timms. Thank you, Your Worship. I pulled this item because I had a couple of residents um, ask me about it and uh, were concerned that perhaps it was allowing us to be less transparent about uh, um, development and I feel that it's a standard operating procedure. So I was wondering if uh, either the um, clerk or CFO could uh, elaborate on it for the public. Thank you. Madam Thank CFO. You. Thank you, through your worship. Um, yes, so this is a standard agreement. It's in place whenever um, different organizations want to work together in a partnership. Uh, in particular, there can be uh, proprietary information that has to be disclosed in order for the partnership to move forward. And of, um, uh, an understanding of the what's important to both parties of a partnership, you want to agree that you're not going to disclose any of that proprietary information that um, could harm the company should you disclose it through the, that negotiation process. So it's not a matter of um, uh, 
hiding any information or not letting information get out that needs to get out. It's proprietary information that's unique to that organization and it's not for public information to be consumed. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, Councillor DeLeo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Okay, once again, I'm going to point out points two, three, and four should be voted on separately, should have been, as it is a request for authorization, whereas point one is only for information. Now, uh, what uh, Councillor Timms was saying, um, I also feel and suggest an amendment to this motion should be made for the specific type of information that would be included in this non-disclosure agreement to ensure that our residents are aware that no decision will be made on the beachfront without input from the elected council. This will be a reassurance to both myself and to residences. Thank you. Someone want to uh, respond in some way or matter? I guess I'll look to, uh, okay, go ahead, Andrew, and then I'm gonna look to the clerk uh, procedurally on uh, the point of whether or not uh, they should have been selected set or voted separately, but uh, uh, Andrew? Yeah, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll step back a little higher and then I'll defer to the, the clerk in a moment. Just so everyone is clear, and I think the treasurer did a, a good job at explaining what this is, this is not about um, trying to keep any of the plans for the beachfront um, secret from the public. What this is, um, Fram has been in the development business for decades. It's a family <laughs> business. Over those years, they've um, developed a development pro forma that makes assumptions about the cost of wood, the cost of concrete, the cost of X number of things. And if you've seen a development pro forma, there are literally hundreds of line items that go into development assumptions. Pro formas are very important to developers because that's how they understand whether a project is viable or not. All Fram has said to us is they have no issue sharing their pro formas with the municipality so that we understand every assumption they have made. Their concern is that if those pro formas are put up on our website, any developer in the province can just copy them and steal what has essentially taken them decades to develop based on their experience. That's all this is. It has nothing to do with the plans that we're creating. We absolutely will be sharing those with the public uh, in the very near term. Um, so I, I just wanted to explain what this is. It's about the cost of a two by four, not that we're trying to keep anything secretive. So I hope that eases any, any concerns that may be out there in the public. I'll, I'll turn it over to Nicole. Thank you, and through your worship. So all decisions with regards to FRAM development, the project itself, will come before Council. This report, every report has the first motion to receive. If you look at every staff report that comes before you, every delegation, every presentation, we simply, Council receives. Um, it's a very common practice and a common motion that forms part of staff reports. The second, third, and fourth motion are what council considers to move the action, or excuse me, to move the business of the municipality. So in this instance, what's being requested is that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the non-disclosure agreement, again, to protect um, the trade secrets, technical, commercial, and financial information uh, that belongs to FRAM, which is very common. That is protected within the Municipal Act, and it's an exemption that we go into closed session. And that's also protected under MFIPA, our privacy legislation. So this, um, that deals with the motion two. Motion three is where it's deemed appropriate. In the delegate authority bylaw, we'd like to include that the CAO be authorized to enter into further NDA agreements. Again, to protect information that is already legally their information protected by MFIPA and the Municipal Act. So that's what the second and fourth motion, uh, third and fourth motion deal with. Number four is allowing me to bring a housekeeping delegate authority bylaw to then put that um, delegate authority within the bylaw. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councillor DeLeo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you possibly make it more clear then on this motion so people have a better understanding, like the way you explained it? It's explained beautifully. Can you possibly maybe add a little more to that so it's more clear? Because this is not clear to me. 
And, and I would add, this is commonplace in most municipalities. It's just a housekeeping item that, that we don't currently have in our bylaw, but this is common practice across the province. I understand that, but again, if we can just add those little, there'll be no more outside questions and put the residents' at ease, minds at ease. It just makes it a lot easier. Madam Clerk? Um, if Council so desires, the motion is um, not within Council's um, at the table yet because it hasn't been read or moved or seconded. Um, we could add a fifth motion that all FRAM uh, related development um, um, council required motions come before council. I, I'm, I'm going you, to be. We're going to let you think on that, Madam Clerk. <laughs> yes, all, all development related decisions have to come before this council. It's automatic. If the council wish, councillor wish to add that motion, um, it's not a requirement. It's it's known that's how we operate um, as municipal government, but we can definitely add that. All right, thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. Any other questions or comments on this matter? Seeing none, I think it's important to note that um, uh, this council and this municipality has absolutely no desire or reason to keep anything or hide anything from the general public. Everything to do with this uh, decision or this uh, contract or this agreement, whether it be with Fram or anyone else uh, uh, in the past or in the future, uh, is, it is and will be completely open and transparent. The cost that the land is sold for will become public. The uh, amount of any uh, loans or mortgages or you name it will all become public information in due time um, when the time is appropriate uh, based on um, fundamental uh, laws and rules with respect to agreements. Um, you know, we have to protect uh, the people we work with, uh, in this case, uh, FRAM, uh, as much as we expect them to protect us until the time is right and uh, to make the public aware of what, uh, what council has decided. So at no time have we ever or will we ever uh, uh, keep anything from the public. We'll make sure that that is done. And, and uh, I'm confident that staff are following standard protocol and practices, which is common within uh, any and or all municipalities, and uh, um, we'll continue to do so. Um, to the councillor's point, if we want to elaborate on um, some of these uh, uh, parts of the motion, I have no issue with that, um, uh, providing that it keeps everything uh, in a legal format so is that we are not disclosing anything uh, that we shouldn't be uh, in due process. All right, nothing else to add from anybody else or staff? All right, I will read the motion then. A recommended motion is that the report titled Fram and Sloker Beachfront Development Non-Disclosure Agreement to the Council meeting of April 11, 2024 be received and two, that the Mayor and Clerk be authorized to execute a non-disclosure agreement with Fram and Sloker. And that staff, uh, where deemed appropriately by the CAO or general manager, be delegated authority to enter into further non-disclosure agreements for the receipt and disclosure of confidential information. And that the Director of Legislative Services clerk be directed to include delegated authority for execution of non-disclosure agreements in future amended to the delegated authority bylaw. Uh, questions or comments? Mover into seconder on this, please. Sorry? So we, we need a motion for that, correct? The recommended motion is now on the floor. Um, there is no mover or seconder. So we could add a motion that all Fram beachfront related uh, decisions come before council for consideration. Oh. Uh, they're going to come before council for consideration at, at any way. Um, so it's just verbiage for the fun of verbiage. I don't have an issue with it, but I guess my point is procedurally, do we move, we need someone, uh, A, ask for that amendment and then someone needs to second that amendment. Am I correct? Yes, if we can get a mover and seconder on the um, recommended motion and then we will seek it if there's an amendment. Okay, thank you. So a mover and a seconder on the motion. I've read Deputy Sm <laughs> Deputy Snell and Councillor Boulanger. <laughs> All right. And then I'm assuming Councillor DeLeo wants to make an amendment and the amendment that the uh, clerk has described. And can she get a seconder for that, please? 
Deputy Mayor so, Snell. So I framed it with part of the motion so we can just call the recorded vote. All right, then if you would do that, please. Um, Councillor Blanchet. In favor. Councillor DeLeo. In favor. Councillor Ego. In favor. Deputy Mayor Snell. In favor. Councillor Timms. In favor. Mayor. In favor. Mayor Smith. In favor. Passes unanimously. Thank you. And now moving on to item number 11.1.1. Uh, the 2024-0327 Township of Clearview easement, sorry, endorsement of Bill C-63 in the House of Commons. And this was pulled by Councillor Timms. Councillor Timms. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, I um, pulled this piece of correspondence because I think it's uh, uh, very much uh, in keeping with our council priority and one that we achieved with our anti-bullying event last year that um, Deputy Mayor Snell um, along with uh, a great deal of sponsorship from our trades community, we're um, able to execute. I think it's uh, an important um, uh, resolution that they're asking of um, the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General uh, to endorse a digital safety commission and nominate an independent ombudsman to keep people safe online. So I'm hoping someone will uh, um, second that, if I move it. All right, so uh, Madam Clerk, I'm gonna let you read uh, a, a recommended uh, uh, motion, and then we'll get a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, based on the discussion, that Council Wasaga Beach endorsed the passing of Bill C-63 for the establishment of a Digital Safety Commission and nomination of an independent ombudsman, and that a copy of the resolution be circulated to all Ontario municipalities, AMO, Terry Dowdall, MP, the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, the Honourable Arif Varani, Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Thank you, Madam Clerk. It is moved by Councillor Timms and seconded by Deputy, uh, do you want to second it? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, Your Worship. Can we also add the County of Simcoe to that list, please? Thank you. Um, if that's okay with the mover? Yes, please. Okay. All right, so we have that motion. We've added the County of Simcoe. Uh, it is moved by uh, Councillor Timms and seconded by Deputy Mayor Snell. All in favor? Oh, no, this needs to be recorded vote. Sorry, Madam Clerk. No. Councillor Belanger. In favor. Councillor DeLeo. In favor. Councillor Ego. In favor. Deputy Mayor Snell. In favor. Councillor Timms. In favor. Mayor Smith. In favor. Carried unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And moving on to item number 14 now, recommendations arising from board uh, and committees. We have none at this time. Uh, item number 15 is council requests for staff reports as listed in the attached documents. Any questions or comments on those reports? Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, forgive me, I have uh, sort of three that I'd like to comment on. Uh, first of all, I, you can see listed in the um, requested list is one that I um, asked for in regards to vaping um, facilities in proximity to our schools. And um, I'd like to pull that off the list. I've had a good conversation with senior staff and um, I feel that we've got some, some strong language coming forward in regards to recommendations when developments come, whether it be Sunnydale, that new Sunnydale subdivision, um, but, or, or when we get our high school down the road. Uh, either way, we, I think we've got some good clarification for 18 plus products to not be uh, within a close access to our students. The second is um, I've been contacted, I was contacted by a couple of residents regarding the Sunshine List when it came out a couple of weeks ago and, and one in particular questioning why the former CAO was on that list mm -hmm. given that he was not in our employ during that year. So again, um, having some conversation with senior staff, I understand that, that this was a result of um, vacation timeline being able to accrue vacation uh, time policy. So 
once I spoke with you, Andrew, about this, it, it allowed some clarification for me. So would you mind sharing so that the general public is aware of this policy and, and what we're going to do to avoid this in the future, please? Sure. Uh, yeah, through Mayor Smith uh, to Deputy Mayor. I, I won't get into details of the employment contract with the previous CAO, but what I will do is share. Um, I too was a little surprised when I saw the Sunshine List come out and, uh, and the salary of, of the previous CAO. Um, looked into the matter and what appears to have happened, the current policy of the municipality allows a staff member, if you have not used up all your vacation by the end of the year, you have a period of time where you can carry it over to the next year and then you, use it, you lose it if you don't use it by that period of time. <clears throat> that applies to every staff, me staff member in this corporation. The interesting item that happened was the CAO approves those carryovers. The previous CAO, <coughs> excuse me for coughing, um, in my opinion, uh, against town policy, approved multiple years of vacation carryovers, which essentially granted himself uh, a significant payout upon his retirement. Um, I was not pleased to hear that, and I followed up with uh, our HR director, and I've asked that that policy be changed uh, so staff are bringing forward a revised policy to prevent that from ever happening again. Um, in my opinion, no employee, including the CAO, should be able to approve their own multiple year carryover that is at odds with municipal policy. So um, it's a loophole and uh, we're fixing it and it should be fixed at the next council meeting. Anything to add, Deputy Mayor Snell? Uh, I'll put it to the floor first, and then I have one more. All right, so Deputy, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Belanger? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I just uh, would ask the question, were we able to uh, verify that all of the carryover uh, was accurate? I, I, I'm assuming we... We checked into that, but it, I, I would agree with you, it's a pretty uh, unique situation. Yeah, through Mr. Mayor, uh, we, we did accurate, did verify it was an accurate balance, but again, it was multiple years of vacation that were being banked. Again, no other employee is allowed to do that. Any other comments on this matter? Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, not relating to this particular conversation, but I just want to, while we're still in the staff report, I'd like to circle back to the request um, to look, uh, to direct staff to look at rerouting that trail in the uh, Blue Shore subdivision. Okay, so you're asking for a report back on the rerouting of the trail through the Blue Shore subdivision? Yes, if the, if, whether, whether staff feel that it should be a report or if they just want to do an, an exploration of it and. I, got, I would assume then bring back what the plan would be or what the cost would be to reroute that trail, uh, as the uh, residents had mentioned it was a concern. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Director, <coughs> uh, through your uh, worship, we'd be more than happy to provide that report. And it's, uh, for the record, it was Blue Water, it's a Blue Water condo. All right, thank you. So uh, there's been a request for report. I think we need a seconder on that, correct? Yes, and if I can just seek clarification. So I understand that the staff requested a report uh, to restrict retail outlets. We're going to introduce a motion to remove that from the council requested staff list. Yes, please. And we understand that policies will be coming forth at the next meeting. The report's actually already in queue, so I don't feel that we need to add that based on the conversation we just had. Yes, I agree. Okay, excellent. So I do have motions prepared. Go ahead, uh, Madam Clerk, with the first motion, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, that the staff requested the council's uh, staff report requested to restrict retail outlets specializing in selling vaping products be removed from that list. 
and further that a report be brought back um, with options to reroute the trail near the Blue Water Condo. All right, uh, is it, a, it is a condominium corporation, that's correct. All right, you've heard the question. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Snell, can we have a seconder for this? Moved by Councillor Eagle, all in favor? Oh, yeah. absolutely, you wanna discuss it? Yeah. Discuss away. Thank you, Your that's Worship, and through you. I just wonder about that, that motion, that report request, if it's, if it's pushing it forward when a lot of this would be dealt with, with the uh, application that's coming forward and, and possibly the uh, OP um, update. Mr. Director? Through your worship, um, if it's council's desire to have a report specific on the on the trail, I would recommend that council do that now. It's a, a, it's not even on the CVD Beechwood property. And as I mentioned, that application may not be coming back to council for two or three months, whereas this report, we could probably get that done quicker than that if, if that's the desire of council. All right, anything further, uh, Councillor Timms? Well, through you, Your Worship, just a comment. So what we're asking to do is reroute that trail from the waterfront onto Beechwood Road. Uh, am I understanding that correctly? Well, I, th I think what the deputy is asking for uh, is a report back that tells us what that would take, how much that would cost, so on and so forth, and it would be to reroute that, I think, to Constance Boulevard. Okay, all right. All right, uh, so moved by Deputy Mayor Snell. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Eagle. Um, Madam Clerk? Uh, no recorded vote required, so you for can no, just call for, All right. Yeah. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Motion carries unanimously. All right, moving on to item number 16, notices of motion we have none today. And item number 17 is closed session with the resolution that pursuant to Municipal Act 2001 is amended the next portion of the April 11th, 2024 council meeting will move into closed session to consider the following matters. 17.1.2 staff report in accordance with section 239.2H information explicitly supplied in confidence to the municipality or local board by Canada, a province or territory or crown agency or any of them. Do we have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Moved by Deputy Mayor Snell, seconded by Councillor DeLeo. All in favor? That carries unanimously and we'll now move into closed session.
through your worship, we're live. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk. We've just come out of closed session from a verbal report from the CAO, and I will uh, look to our clerk for a rise and report. Thank you, Your Worship. Council met in closed session uh, on April 11th, 2024 at 2.50 p.m. to hear matter 17.1.2, a verbal staff report in accordance with section 239.2H. As a result of that discussion, there's nothing further to report at this time. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now moving on to item number 18, bylaws, recommended motion out of bylaws 2024-24, 2024-2025, and 2024-26 be received and to be de have been deemed to have been read a first, second, and third time, passed and numbered this 11th day of April 2024. Mover and a seconder for this, please. Moved by Councillor DeLeo, seconded by Councillor Eagle. All in favor? <laughs> that motion carries unanimously. And uh, we'll now adjourn this meeting at 3.25 p.m. This meeting is adjourned.